and then from there. So when you study business education, you had what, like a diploma? Uh, no, you do um, Royal Society of Us, RSA. Okay. Stage two. Okay. You know, by this stage one and stage two. And then you, also, you could also do London Chamber of Commerce. Okay. So I did those. And Which year was this? Which period was this? Um, we're talking 70s. 70s, okay. Late 60s okay. 70s, okay. Yes. <laughs> Mm. So, um, what happened was I was there was that there were two teachers uh, who took a keen interest, uh, Mr. Kuyo. I'm still in touch with him in particular. He's still alive. Still alive, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, he said, you know, to do uh, GC, O level, private, okay. love deck. Okay. <laughs> so, I did choose the business subjects and bought some books and things and then did government and uh, I was at the school set. Mm -hmm. That's what he advised. Okay. And luckily I, I, I got it. Okay. Uh, so another father was I got admission to New Jabin to do this form. Okay. Uh, but then I continued on the technical track. Came to a crap polytechnic. <coughs> so you didn't pursue the sixth form? No. I Although chose, you qualified. I qualified. You didn't pursue. Yeah. No. Okay. So I decided to come to Accra, mm. where they did a diploma in business studies. Where? <coughs> Accra Polytechnic. Okay, now Accra Technical, Technical University. University. Okay. And who is also now? Yeah. The Technical University. Okay. It became a Polytechnic then. Technical. Okay. So I did a diploma, higher diploma in, in business studies. Mm -hmm. The wise there, I did the RS 63. Okay. And then did the A levels. Oh, also yes. as a private as student? As a private student. Okay. <coughs> and so with that combination, I was among, I think, the third or fourth batch to enter the Bachelor of Commerce degree in the University of Kansas. Become? Become, yes. At UCC? Yeah. Whoa. What a pass. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's motivational, you know, yeah. especially for... Yeah. I, I, I tell a story to encourage, you know, particularly brilliant... And, yes. and then also the role teachers play, mm. you know, in pushing so Mr. Kujo and, and the other teacher? Mr. Tafa. The other one is Mr. Tafa? Yes, but the head of department was from Kobo Dumasi, okay. Mr. Baja. Okay. You know, so, so they were those who encouraged you to um, sit for the whole level as a private student? As a private. Okay. And then I met Mr. Ajakwa, mm. who was the son of a president at the Polytechnic. And he pushed me into, when he saw everything, he pushed me into the A-levels. The A-levels too? Yeah, by then management had come, accounting had come. And, okay. You know, so, okay. and then so I did a general paper. Okay, so, so <coughs> you, 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 you then got the um, admission to UCC yeah. um, to, to read a BCom. Bachelor of Commerce. Yes. Okay. And uh, so... After, after which I did a C exam. You charted? Yeah, yes. Okay. So after BCom, then you chatted as an accountant? As an accountant, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. And then the master's came along. <laughs> okay. okay. I was checking out your profile. I realized that uh, after your, your CA, um, almost everything else is uh, in the United States. You did an MBA in the States. You were at Harvard University, Kennedy School. Yeah, where I did an MPA. Yes. Actually, I wanted to do... MBA, but MBA is more expensive than MPA. And I was already, I was then part of the structural adjustment program, secretariat, mm. the ERP staff. Oh, you were working then? <clears throat> yes. Mm. So when we come to the working, but the academic side, so it okay. was whilst I was there, okay. got a scholarship to go to Kennedy School. All right. But I had always wanted to get an MBA. Okay. So whilst teaching, which was gave us. Yes. So whilst teaching, you know, I register in another class, not my class, <laughs> <laughs> to get the MBA. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So interesting. <laughs> so that's how come you have those two from uh, uh, the US. The yeah. US. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So, so, <clears throat> so you you charted as an accountant. You did your BCom. You did your MPA, your MBA as well, and um, you started work. There's no PhD, contrary to what many people think. Okay. Yeah, so I must be. <laughs> <laughs> Make that clear. I'm, I'm sure that, I mean, with all your <laughs> teaching experience and all that, if you indeed want to, 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 uh,
uh, study for one, you can. Not an honorary one. Um, yeah, who knows? It could be retirement. Yeah. Occupation. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so let's, let's now look at um, um, your working life. You, you've been described as a technocrat and not a politician. I'm sure that you have heard that. Oh, yes. Is that how you describe yourself? I'm a technocrat, I do accept, who worked around politics for a long time. A That's technocrat what, who worked around politics? Around politics, in policy. In policy? Yeah. And, and, never, and never became a politician? Uh, my, my community in Somalia had wanted me to be an MP for a okay. long time. But I enjoyed policy. To enjoy policy. Yes. Okay. So let's speak about um, um, Seth the technocrat. What makes you a technocrat? Well, career-wise, so it's linked to the career. <clears throat> um, I did my na national service at the National Procurement Agency. Mm -hmm. You know, and whilst at the end of the national service, for that particular year, for some mm -hmm. reason, we were not taking on. But we're talking about procurement agency in the period of shortages and arrest, so it was... Which year was this? Um, 86. 86. Okay. I was among the Luther graduates who stayed at home for... Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. So instead of completing 83, I completed in 84. Okay. And then I did a two-year national service. Yeah. And <clears throat> so at the end of it, I had started my CA in Ghana, so I had already done the part one and part two professional. Um, so, since we're not going to be taking, I, I initially wanted to join the accounting firm. So, I did an interview with Pete Mawick then, and now KPMD, mm. um, with a view to when I completed three. But then, my manager, and uh, if she's listening, apologies, I should have attended, I was taking the but I should have attended the, the function, which okay. I promised. My manager then, um, said, came to my office and said, so said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I've been teaching part-time, so at best I would continue with teaching. That is going to the Ghana education stream, mm -hmm. a KVA student, mm -hmm. which many of my colleagues were doing. Mm -hmm. Or, since I'm doing the CA, if I qualify, then I would look to, you know, join in the accountancy stream. So one afternoon she came and said, uh, she's Mrs. Batascudio. Um, said, okay, said, come along. I sat in a car and we went to the ministries. That was when customs and IRS were being removed from the civil service. Thank you. To be made autonomous. So they were initially <coughs> part of the civil service? Yes. Customs? Yeah, it's customs department. And IRS? And then, yeah, and then the Internal Central Revenue, Revenue Department. Okay. So they were removed from the civil service between 84 and 86. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of my national service, so we went in and there was a knock on the door. I saw a minister there and we went in and mm. uh, you couldn't miss him. Mr. Tuahoe, and I always say that. <laughs> oh, Mr. Tuahoe was a minister? Was a minister. Okay. And I didn't know that, you mm. know, my manager was a sister at the time. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. So he said, I've brought this gentleman, you know, who needs a job. She said, where do you know him? I said, I said, it's my, my boy. So <laughs> then, I know to me, when Mr. Labisian was moved from GMPA that year, he joined Mr. Hoy mm -hmm. to do the tax reforms mm -hmm. at the National Revenue Secretariat, okay. which is the institution, the autonomous institution that preceded Revenue Agency's governing board and Ghana Revenue Authority. Mm. So you were asking about Revenue Authority. Right. So that's yes. So, so he called my boss at GMPA, the chief executive who was with him. He said, then Mr. Lavisa must know him. He said, of course. We're talking to his sister. And so uh, then he rang the bell and said, she'll call Mr. Lavisa. He comes in and she said, how are you? What are you doing here? Mm. And then he says, okay, if you know him, he needs a job. Mm. <laughs> so mm. I was trained you know, as an income tax officer, 
at NRS, you have to do both. Okay. So I, I, I remained there, and then my colleagues also came in, mm -hmm. and they went to IRS and Custom. Okay. And, and that's how my professional career started. Mm. I was there when I qualified to link the two, as I was... When you chatted? When I chatted. Okay. And because IRS had, and Customs had been removed from the civil service, their conditions of service were enhanced. Mm -hmm. So I saw accountants moving from private sector and coming in to take positions. Oh. Uh, Mr. Adom, Raf Tufour, Mr. Soti, Mr. Mante, you know, and uh, quite a number of them, Mr. Hammond, you know, all of who became my, you know, my friends because, mm -hmm. so I decided to, to just stay. Okay. And then after I qualified, um, <clears throat> Mr. Misata and the list of me decided to give me expenditure jobs. Mr. Hoy became also the head of the Structural Adjustment Program Secretariat mm -hmm. and the rest is history. So that's when I started my policy. Okay. Public financial management. Anyway, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so you stayed as a tax man, as an accountant who had become a tax man. Yes. And seeing and, and learning from seniors who had come in mm. and were fashioning out the public financial management mm. tax reforms. Mm. Um, and of course, that's how Professor Mills came in. Okay, how did he come in? Well, he, was, he, he came in um, as the chairman of the new board of Internal Revenue Service. Mm. So, and then later became the commissioner before vice president. So this so should, experience this should be in the early 90s? Yes. Okay. 80s into the 90s. 80s Late into 80s, the 90s. 80s into the 90s. This is okay. where all this was. Uh, okay. The act was 1986. Okay. So, so where did VAT come in? Yes, VAT is part of the reforms under the Economic Recovery Program or Structural Adjustment Program. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and VAT had be, it, it's, it's a concept that started in France, some say elsewhere. In the, uh, so obviously in Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, because, uh, and it changes the method for um, collecting general consumption taxes. Mm -hmm. And we had the old version, the UK version, was a sales tax. And then the, so the trend was changing towards VAT. Mm -hmm. and, and so Ghana, we were doing a lot of significant reforms under the, you know, we created IRS. So Ghana actually started autonomy. Mm -hmm. And actually Mr. Lavisian went on to become the first Commissioner General for Uganda Revenue Authority. Uganda? Yes. Okay. And the first Commissioner after the war. Mm -hmm. And the first Commissioner General after the war for Rwanda Revenue Authority. Oh. And he did some assignments as my former boss. He was then the chief director for revenue okay. and did some consulting and then you know left mm -hmm. you know um and that was the year he, he left with her, in which i also went to harvard mm -hmm. yes to mm -hmm. to do my masters mm -hmm. after i qualified so so is that when we decided so to VAT, set up a vat service yes no the decision to set up a vat to introduce the vat okay mm -hmm. to introduce the vat we should have introduced the vat in the late 80s <clears throat> really? Yeah. Because we had done a lot of reforms. The autonomy was, remember, 84, 80. We had streamlined the tax structure. And so VAT was the last. We used to have super sales tax overlapping. We used to have all kinds of, you know, so we streamlined it and said there must be anchor tax instruments as the developing countries and advanced countries have. Mm -hmm. So the first anchor tax instruments is the corporate income tax. That's the income tax, which has a corporate element and then has the personal income tax element. Mm -hmm. Depending on whether you are a natural person or you are an artificial person. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the second is the VAT. But we have many countries have sales and service taxes. Okay. And that's it. These two are the general taxes. Mm -hmm. It affects every citizen. Mm -hmm. For as long as you, you start work, mm -hmm. and for as long as you consume coffee, mm. anything, mm. water, you paid a general consumption tax. Mm. But we had two 
general consumption tax. It's like many English speaking countries. Mm -hmm. The sales tax and then the service taxes. Okay. So countries were merging the two into VAT. Why was the name changed? VAT is collected incrementally. Sales tax is collected at one point. And so it was customs which was collecting and then manufacturing. So we extended it to retail and to my, uh, warehouse, uh, sorry, um, uh, yeah, the warehouse stage and then the retail stage. Mm. So this, uh, this is a major change okay. that took place. Uh, and then, so that's the second. Then we have two taxes which are not general in the sense of the income tax and the VAT mm -hmm. or sales tax, mm -hmm. but are still pillars. And the first is import duty. And it's not general because it's on only imports. Okay. So if you import this cup, you pay VAT. Mm -hmm. And if you manufacture it, you, you VAT will be charged on it. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's non-discriminatory. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if you decide to impose on an import duty, then it becomes discriminatory. That is, the cap that is produced locally, there's no equivalent tax. It's just an import duty. So if you don't import, if you bring in the raw materials and everything, you, you pay. Mm. But once you are selling it domestically, but if you import then you pay VAT. And that's why it's also a protective tax. Mm -hmm. It protects local industries mm -hmm. who are manufacturing equivalent mm -hmm. you know, goods. And it's very popular in developing countries. Mm -hmm. um, then the last one is excise duty, mm -hmm. the last pillar. And that is punitive. Punitive and therefore it's on selected commodities. The three main ones being tobacco, alcohol, and petroleum. Petrols when you go to buy. Why, why, why do you put a... What's the principle behind putting a punitive tax on petroleum? Environmental. Okay. So that's the, when I took issue. When the environmental tax, you know, levy was done. And I said, no, we already have. Ghana has had an environmental tax since the 80s. When the, you know, structure was streamlined. Mm. And, and so it's because... And back then, it's, it's, it's not as popular as it is today. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, but the principle remained. Mm -hmm. And many countries had excise duty, mm -hmm. you know, on petroleum. Mm -hmm. And because it's punitive, it varied by the age of the vehicle. You know, we used to ban even 10-year-old vehicles yes. from being imported. And it varied by the capacity of the vehicle. So if you import a V8, you pay more import duty. The value is higher, but you pay a higher rate than if you imported you know, uh, on the exercise side. You pay import duty, but you also, it has an equivalent exercise. Mm. Yeah. Th there's something that I don't yeah. understand, and it's, it's not for us to digress. We'll still follow because we're building something. But I'll just ask you that, because you mentioned this issue of vehicle, there's something that baffles my mind. Yes. It looks like a tax regime is punitive when it comes to importation of vehicles. The newer the vehicle you buy, the more you pay because the consumption tax. Yes, and and I'm I'm trying to marry this with the issue of um, um, the environment and all that. But that one goes to you know every import has a value on which the tax is is uh, is calculated. Okay. Calculated. Mm. Whether it's import duty, whether it's um, uh, VAT or excise, right? So the value is it's not just in relation to vehicles. This phone mm -hmm. being a note is more expensive mm -hmm. than any other. Exactly, any other. And therefore, if this phone is imported, the importer will pay a higher value. And you know the cost, the Method of calculations is the cost, the insurance, and the freight. Mm -hmm. So what we are talking about, as it's not, it's just that the cost of a vehicle is high. Mm. Yes, and customs has 
a table based on the age of the vehicle, you know, and it's used. You know, you can either use the value, and this is my, a lot of controversy for people bringing in, the yes. value at which you bought, mm -hmm. you know, but it's arm's length, you don't know, um, and there's no international measure. Mm -hmm. Some say blue book and other things to get, that gives you the value of the vehicle as it ages, in advanced countries as it ages. But in the case of customs, and I hope that, I, I, I'm not sure, I think it's still the, <clears throat> the method, they use the manufacturer's, you know, value, the mm -hmm. year in which the vehicle was manufactured, mm -hmm. which is always used to be on the seat belt and other places. Mm -hmm. So that's the basis. And then they have the value, and then the manufacturer's value in dollars, which is converted into cities. Mm -hmm. So that's why your expensive vehicle, you know, for import duty is higher. But then you come to excise, and you pay less excise. Because your vehicle is newer, unless the capacity is big also. Okay. So the exercise then becomes the reverse. The older the vehicle, because it's environmental, the more you pay. Mm. Because you are bringing uh, an old vehicle with a weaker engine, mm -hmm. you know, and all that. Right? Mm. Uh -huh. But then, if your expensive vehicle is also a Benz, it's also, you know, it, it can be a C, 250, 200. Uh, but as you go up to Y and to S, mm. you know, then the capacity increases, you know, the noise make increases for some of the, mm. and so uh, that is where the punitive element comes in. Mm. The import duty is non discriminatory, but the punitive element comes in because you are consuming more fuel and you are polluting the environment. Mm. All right. Okay. So, so let's, let's still be on track on the transition, you know. So you've told us how VAT came in and all that. So at the time that the government tried to introduce VAT with Kumi Preku and all that, where were you? I was in National Revenue Secretariat and Structural Adjustment. So I knew that VAT was, to, as I said, should have been introduced in the late 80s. There were studies. One of the studies was by Harvard Institute for International Development. Mm. And so... One of the things that occurred was in Harvard, you are allowed to cross register. So, even though it's Kennedy School, you can cross register to the law school, you can cross register to economics or to the business school. Mm -hmm. I and see you, you, you did a program at the Harvard Law School. Does it? The okay. VAT is one. So, I was just yes. coming to that. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I did the, there was an international tax program, which is a Harvard Law School program, okay. you know, which you know, uh, those go in mid-career and in tax administration. You, so you normally get a diploma, but you get your MB, uh, MPA. Mm. Um, the tax program is no longer. So I did, so I, that's a law school program, but then I cross-registered purposes to do the VAT. Mm. And so, because I knew Ghana was going to be into the VAT, mm. and the two professors who were handling, one was a visiting professor, were the ones who wrote the book that was, it was their report, and it became a very popular VAT book, apart from Alan Tate, which was written at the, by the IMF mm. at the time. So one of the lecturers, Professor Oldman, was teaching the VAT, and everybody said he had a very deep insight, and then he had a, a visiting, you know, lecture. Anyway, the long and short of it is that I was in a class, and there was a World Bank visiting uh, scholar, you know, for example, when I was at the front, I was teaching also at the IMF Institute. And so you do this. I used to go to Dr. Boji's class, but then when he was in Harvard, yeah. Mm. So he came in. He was called Chad Licho. He saw me. He said, oh, yeah, you are here finally. And I said, yes. So he came back and told Mr. Misata that I was in a VAT class. So immediately I came Mr. back. Mr. Misata, the former was vice president. was the deputy minister, yes. He was deputy finance minister. Yes, he okay. was deputy finance minister with a list on me. Yes. And then Mr. Howe was at the Revenue Secretariat. Okay. And all of them had to do a lot with the reforms. Mm. So when I came back, you know, Mr. Misada comes to, he comes to Sakumono to visit the sister who was in customs. Mm. I was in a, an NRS. So he came in, knocked, and he said, uh, said uh, when is your leave ending? And I said, oh, I just came. And he said, okay, it's Katil, you see me in the office. So I went, and then he said, 
Charlie just tells me that you did, you did that, okay? Uh, the president has agreed to get in consultation with your minister that he should be the VAT coordinator. So oh. I became the national VAT, you know, coordinator. VAT coordinator. Oh, okay. <laughs> in okay. 1993. 93. Yes. So, so I was in Havana in So you were the one who actually led the VAT? The technical phase. The first, together with Mr. Blankson, who became... You know, uh, GRA comes GRA comes okay. He was from customs. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then uh, Mr. Zagro, remember some of the names, the late G Minor. Uh, so we, the project team was formed. Okay. You know, so, but when it failed and it had to be reintroduced, then Mr. Samoa, who was a, you know, more senior and a deputy commissioner in GRA, was brought in to be head. Of the VRE, uh, sorry, the, uh, let's 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 step back a bit. <laughs> yes, from a policy point of view, what were the lessons you learned? Why did it fail? From a policy point of view, I'm sure that technically, <clears throat> your team thought that look, everything was in place, you had done everything, you were ready to go. Yes, are uh, two factors. One, I would say, misrepresentation of what the the tax. You know, men. Misrepresentation. Yes. Uh, for it? example, many people did not know that VAT was replacing the sales and service taxes. W was it? Was it also because in your um, policy formulation and implementation stage, you did not also factor effective communications? Communication was certainly, you know, a factor uh, because it had also become the second factor. You know, nineteen. The constitution had come into effect in 1992. Political parties had come in, and so the VAT was, you know, presented as some punitive, you know, succession. By then, FATIC was set in for year up. You know, year up was 1983, 84. Economic recovery program. Program and the structure adjustment program. You know, so as it's almost a, a decade on. And a lot of tax reforms were implemented. So fatigue was set in. And so it got embroiled in the politics of the time. But, you know, the reintroduction of uh, party politics. Mm. Uh, so you know the story about Kumi Preko and mm. all that. Yeah. Well, well, in view of uh, the fatigue and all that, I mean, if you had factored all that into your policy uh, formulation and implementation, could you therefore have reviewed the initial rate? Um, yes and no, because ultimately the VAT was introduced at a lower rate. Mm. You know, That's so, after the failure? Yes, after the failure, mm. at 10%. So certainly that would have been a factor. Uh, but I say professionally that our, the VAT was introduced at the sales tax rate of 15% at the time. Okay. So the sales tax and then the service taxes were already, you know, at those, the service taxes varied a bit. And then it was supposed to go to 17.5. So the sales tax policy, remember we we're doing a lot of reforms of the income tax and all that. So as part of strengthening the sales tax, quite independent of the, of the uh, VAT. You know, the rates were normally, they were, they were having a downward trend. For example, income tax had come down from 65, 55% to 25%. It was a long program to reduce, as you expand the base of the tax, mm -hmm. I knew you automated and the rest. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's yes and no, no in the sense that the rate was not uh, as punitive because that was the sales tax rate. And moreover, businesses were getting credits where under the for taxes they paid on input, which was limited to the ring under the sales tax, you know, the limited to manufacturers, basically. But it became generally available, and that reduced the cost of production. Right, so um, it's debatable. Uh, so if I these are all in, in an article I wrote, you know, okay. which became VAT in Ghana, why, why it failed. Mm -hmm. So you had to look at everything, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And it was, you know, it's, it became global because mm -hmm. few people expected Ghana to fail in introducing VAT. Ghana had joined Malta, Grenada, 
and one other country as the only countries that introduced VAT and fuel out of about 50 countries at the time. Mm. So it was big news because we were leading in Africa. Mm. You know, we had done autonomy, I told you even. We were spoiling Mr. Labisa went with Ghanaians, you know, the little Mamu and others, you know, to introduce the GRA, uh, URA and all that, you know. Mm. So, so yes and no. But then on the introduction, one of the compromises was to reduce the rate. Okay. So it was introduced at 10%, mm. but it wasn't fiscally feasible. And so in comes GET fund, mm -hmm. you know, which is a VAT, mm -hmm. but dedicated to education. Mm -hmm. And then when the Kufu administration comes in, 12.5% was not enough. Mm. But so in comes National Health Insurance, mm. which is, was collected as though it were VAT. Mm. And so it became 15%. Mm. And then later when we were setting up the infrastructure fund, mm. we moved it to the 17% where it's which was most countries okay. more recently, yes. Mm. Uh, so Part of the destruction of the VAT today is the fact that the GET fund and the NHIL have been removed and they are called street levies and businesses are denied the input tax credits. Explain that. Okay. Yes. So if I am the manufacturer, if I manufacture this car, obviously, even if I bought the ceramics or whatever inputs, uh, to, to manufacture, I will pay VAT at the port. Mm. But, and then when I sell to a wholesaler, I will charge VAT. And then when the wholesaler sells to a retailer, he also charge VAT or sales tax. And it's only when it goes to the consumer who buys it at the end of the chain, there's a value at the chain. Mm. It says everybody is adding a value. Mm. That the impact of the tax rests where it ought to be. It's a tax on consumption. Remember, I was saying that in streamlining the VAT or sales tax was seen as a general consumption tax. Mm -hmm. It doesn't discriminate, except where we have a conscious policy. For example, we are not going to charge VAT on textbooks. It's, you know, we are not going to charge VAT on some basic health products. We are not going to charge VAT on domestically produced goods. But if you want to import, import yam, you pay VAT because we have, then it becomes like a protective. Mm. So anybody who is registered, who is not the final consumer, if I buy this uh, cup for say 100, and let's simplify, the rate is 10%, I'm supposed to pay VAT of 10. I set it aside because I'm registered. I don't add it to cost. Are you following? Because I'm only an agent for collection. Okay. Ultimately, the one who has to pay is a final consumer. So anybody in that chain is just, you know, adding cost, margin, but they are not a final consumer. Mm -hmm. But they are being used to collect the tax in stages. And that is because the invoice I give you, which is my sales invoice, becomes your purchases invoice. And when you sell, right, when you sell, as you are the wholesaler, if you sell to the retailer where the, the, consumer, the consumer comes in, you, are, you, all, you now have two invoices. You are issuing a sales invoice, and then you are keeping the purchase invoice. Remember, I'm allowed to set aside the term because I'm not the final consumer. And then I sell to you for 120 times 10. It becomes 12. Okay, I hope you are following. Mm -hmm. It becomes, I bring in, I import this as an importer. 100. Mm -hmm. I pay VAT. Let's forget about the other taxes. I pay VAT. 10. Okay. I add 20 as my transportation, salary, and other things. Your overheads. Yes, overheads okay. plus a margin, my yes. profit. Yes. Let's say all of it is 20. Okay. Right? So the cost increases from, the cost without VAT increases from 100, 100 to 120. 120. Yes. You are registered. Mm -hmm. 
so long as you are registered, you charge 10% on the 12. You don't add the 10. If you add the 10, it becomes 130. Because the, the part of your cost, the bulk of your cost is 100 on which the VAT has been paid already. Mm -hmm. And since you are registered, you have the privilege, you know, of setting that aside so it doesn't increase your cost. Okay. Then finally, you sell it at, say, 150. Okay. Or, yeah, 130 or 150. Let's say 150. So you are now selling it to the retailer. You know, let's just end in there to the retailer at 150. You charge the, v the retailer 10%. 15 cities. Which is 15. Now you see, in that 150, it started with 100 plus 20 <laughs> plus 30 mm -hmm. to get a 150. Mm -hmm. The tax was being collected 10% on 100, 10% on 120, 10% on 150. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is a better mechanism for collection. This is why many countries adopted it because when I give you, you the invoice, my sales invoice, and you uh, you also add your 130, you, sorry, you, you add your uh, 20 to become 120. Remember, I charge 12. Yes. The 12 is broken down into the 100 I paid GRE already. So, in actual fact, you are adding a value of 20. So, two. the tax should have been 2. Yes. But you charge 10. So, you are allowed to deduct, you charge 12. You are allowed to deduct the 10 mm -hmm. from the 12 and pay only 2 to GRE. Oh. But the precondition for doing that is that you must have an invoice to show that, you know, I gave you an invoice to show that, you know, you paid the VAT to me. Otherwise, okay. you cannot deduct. Okay. So that's the credit method. Mm -hmm. And this is what reduces the cost until it gets to the final, final consumer. consumer. Okay. And it reduces the cost for the final consumer. Because if you don't have the invoice, when GRA comes to do examination, they would reject you know, where's your proof that you paid the 10? They reject it, and you are forced to add the 10. So it becomes 130 instead of 120, and then you charge a higher, you know, tax. So how does the, the new classification change this? It blocks, it blocks the right to credit for you, for me, and for the retailer. Right, the right to credit on the, on the early the child and get fund. Yes. You see, if it's treated as VAT, then they would, you know, the rate of, we simplify it to 10, but the NHL and the, and the debt fund, you know, added to the VAT, so it's 15% instead yes. of 10. I will just simplify it. Mm. By taking it out, it means 5%, you know, of the 15, you cannot take a credit. Okay. Yes. So if we take the, the between me and you, my hundred, if you add NHI and, and get fund, right, it becomes the rate is fifteen exactly. Mm. And then but you set the fifteen aside. But then your cost now and then you add you also charge fifteen, right, when you sell at one twenty. What is done is that you can deduct. Previously you would deduct the entire fifteen. Mm -hmm. Currently, you can't deduct. Businesses can't deduct the five. We can deduct only ten. Only ten, and therefore they are forced to add the five to their cost. So is that why people, some people have calculated and they say that the VAT we are actually paying is twenty one point nine percent instead of. I mean, if you yes, look at yes, it on the face of it, yes. Yeah, I, I say that the VAT you are paying because what's in the name? <laughs> it's a consumption tax, mm -hmm. and you only removed it from the base, and then you are calling it straight levy. So, know, so, so, and you are reintroducing. So, you know, so, yes. so, like the, the then finance minister announced, the, he announced this, and the issue was that look, they've not increased VAT, but by changing the calculation of the V, by breaking it down, yeah. Uh, it has increased the it, tax yes, increased them, yes. without adding 1% to it. Exactly. And you are treating it like an excise or a levy because they don't have the benefit of, you know, if you, if you sell the, your vehicle or, you, you know, excise in principle, it continues. Mm. You know, if you bring in, let's say, it's, it's, uh, alcohol on, you know, the industrial type to do spirits, you know, you excise, you pay at the port, 
you don't get a relief unless you are going to export the gin. If you are going to sell locally, you add it to cost. Mm. You know, so, I mean, you merely re- take something out, which businesses had a benefit, give it a different name, and then you say the VAT rate has been reduced. And, but the, <laughs> you've introduced a levy. Mm. So the levy plus it is. And to some of us, you've made it worse. Mm. You've made it worse because you are now preventing something which businesses were not treating as cost. So for as long as, for as, long as the chain continues, Right, mm. and uh, let's say there's a big retailer, right? And I'm 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 in Somalia, and I buy from that retailer, but I'm also qualified to register for VAT. That's what we call cascading. Mm. The tax is being added at every stage, right? So it's a big deficiency, and that's why those who oppose it. You see that when that matter came, the first to react actually were Gassim, the alcoholic companies and the rest who publish their prices they increase immediately because what used to be a relief had become you know a cost hmm. all yeah. right okay all right so let's step i'll be a viewers for yeah. <laughs> let's step back a bit and uh, this is the technical part of it yes so let's step up back so you were with this project team you were the project lead doing vat the one is as i'm working uh-huh he was substantive project lead. The VAT service? Yes. Mm-hmm. The VAT service was created mm-hmm. in addition to internal revenue service and, you know, because the sales tax on imports was taken, customs continued to collect it, and it was a fashion. You know, we call it tax type organization, which we moved. It explains why we merged mm. VAT mm. and the income tax department as part of the reforms. Mm. Yeah, but previously every tax type had a, so customs had this mm. uh, institution, uh, income tax had this institution, and the VAT had this institution. Mm. Except under the sales tax, it was being collected by a domestic division of customs because they were also collecting excise. Mm. Yeah. Right. So, so you you worked on the VAT to win. I went, in fact, when it was reintroduced, I remained the, the, when the, the, the announcement was made to reintroduce the VAT, I remained the coordinator. Mm. And then until the VAT service was created and I became a deputy. Which was when? Uh, VAT service was actually created with the first law 1994, which mm. was suspended after the cancellation in 1995. Mm. And then reinstated in 1996 when it was introduced. So okay. I became the Deputy Commissioner of Finance and Administration. Okay. And that was my last you know, position before I left the country. When did you leave the country? I left in 1999. 1999? Why? Um, when the VAT failed, I told you the VAT was a global phenomenon. Mm. So when the VAT failed, I had an offer you know, to join the IMF, IMF. as a mid-career, yes. Okay. The Fiscal Affairs Department was in the lead in introducing the VAT, you know. So when I wrote that article and others, you know, so I had the offer. But then Prof. Mills, who had become running mates, told me the VAT would be introduced, you know, reintroduced when, you know, um, the NDC won the 1996 elections. And so I asked if they could defer the appointment until after. You asked the IMF to defer? Yeah, okay. more or less. Yeah. And so I didn't go back then. But then the offer came again after it was reintroduced, interviews and everything, and then I left. So you left in 1999? 1999, okay. yes, to join the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. And you stayed there for how long? For 10 years. Okay. So we'll take a break. When we return, <laughs> we'll look at... 99 to 2009. Okay, so what led you to come back into the country? What led you to become a deputy minister and then a minister? And uh, I, I, I have a friend who sent me a text who says that listening to you, he now understands why we had a lot of taxes in this, in this country under your tenure. Actually, we had lesser taxes. We will look at that <laughs> after this break. <laughs>
this is a call to you. The dreamers. The ones that see no boundaries. Dreamers take a chance. The explorers that chart their own path. Along the vibes connect the energy. The ones that dare to challenge the status quo. Get connected, feel the vibe. When others try to think outside the box, you wonder what box. Catch the wave, enjoy the ride. To the architects of their journeys. Every connection is an opportunity to explore every experience. This is your call to adventure. Your journey begins here. Be bold. Be daring. Be free. Connecting passions. Connecting dreams. Connecting ambitions. Telesel. Connecting energies. Welcome.com In today's modern world, Stairs are a challenge, especially for our elderly and those with health concerns. Navigating them can be difficult and even dangerous, but there's a safer way to move vertically. Lifts and Elevators Limited Company, your answer to a more accessible and secure vertical transportation. Our elevators and escalators, including top-of-the-line pneumatic vacuum elevators, Fuji elevators and escalators, offer a safer and more convenient alternative, eliminating the risks of of stairs and enhancing accessibility for homes, businesses, and hospitals. Choose safety and convenience with lifts and elevators limited company. Elevate your spaces today. For more information, visit our website at www.elevatorsgh.org or call now on 0200-535-515. Lifts and Elevators Limited Company, the elevator people. We are back, bringing you the latest lineup from Betway. Yeah, um, yeah. Betway starts strong with your front two, with free play Friday and swipe bet. I'm food, man. In the middle, you've got all the control, with cash out and build a bet. Plus, with win boost, you can boost your sports bet. At the back, they have smart picks and the partial daily jackpot. You always get way more with Betway. And you might not see. This address has been vetted and approved by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Bet responsibly. No under 18. Terms and conditions apply. Betway. Get way more. Customer, customer. Nanamika. Ah, Nanamika. 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 Uh, 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 54,000 Ghana cities. 54,000? 54,000. 540,000. Yeah. 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 One of our daily lucky winners. Dial star 946 hash to play now. Or you can also play online at www.gameparkgames.com. Game Park is regulated by the National Lottery Authority. Right, welcome back to the show. If you just joined us, this is a special edition of Good Morning Ghana, uh, the one-on-one with the Honorable Sir Tepe, former finance minister of this uh, republic. 
And uh, we've just uh, finished a warm-up session. We are now getting into the, the real meat uh, shortly. But uh, what does wealth mean to you? Do you want to live like a tycoon? Remember, I was God and Mullah got the power. Ghana's newest lottery game draws live on Adum TV at 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 6 p.m. daily. Now pick up your phones, tablets, and computers and download the Game Park Games app on Play Store. You can also play on the website at www.gameparkgames.com or by dialing star 946 hash on all networks. Just choose four numbers from 0 to 9. It's easy to play and easy to win. Charlie, make we play this game and make some Mullah. Nobody beats our odds in Ghana. Game Park Games, more Mullah, more power. This game is regulated by the National Lottery Authority and is not for persons under 18 that play responsibly. A year so cool. That could somewhat damn be big, but Betway's cash out be bigger. Betway is giving you more control over every thrilling bet you place. Enjoy the biggest and most reliable cash out in Ghana on Betway without any hassle. Sign up today at betway.com.gh. Terms and conditions apply. It's not for persons under 18 and is regulated by the Gaming Commission of Ghana. Betway, get way more. And Blue Jeans Energy Drink has been on the Ghanaian market for over 20 years. We already know what it does for the body. It contains vitamins and nutrients like vitamin B2, B3, B6, B12, as well as taurine and guarana, which are known to boost your strength and energy as well as promote high performance and endurance. Blue Jeans Energy Drink has been tested and tried. It's indeed the best. Blue Jeans Energy Drink is for bold and active men and women. So go and grab a cold can and power your day. It's in shops nationwide for bulk purchases, Contact Budget Cash and Carry Limited on 0208-128190 or 0550-001-0000. All right, and um, just to inform you that it's not too late to join the ultimate Easter shopping experience. Here I'm talking about This Is Ghana, uh, which is happening from today to Sunday. Uh, that's on the Sioux Oxford Street. And uh, this is by Ignite Media Group, and it's the long-awaited Easter Sales Expo. And so there's going to be a parade of a colorful display of Made in Ghana brands and products. And um, like I said, it's happening from today uh, to the 31st of March uh, on also Oxford Street. And it's to bring together buyers and sellers from all over Ghana for a festive shopping experience. And there will be irresistible discount offers. This is an incredible deal for traders, merchants, entrepreneurs, and anyone in business. And for as little as 300 Ghana cities, you can get to showcase your brand or products through live TV interviews, commercials, and many more. So it's not too late. You still can get in touch with the sales team um, on 0244-598-747 or 0548-390-970. That is 0244-598-747 or 0548-390-970. And this Easter Sales Expo is sponsored by Appointed Time Printing, AH Hotel and Conference, Islegon, Blue Jeans Energy Drink, Original 91.9 FM, Metro TV and Original TV. And um, I will be there from today to Sunday. Uh, that's um, on the Sewers for Street, so don't miss out you can still do business with us or you can still come there and uh, patronize uh, all these incredible made in ghana uh, products now oh no let's move on to so you left and went to work with the imf they've been looking for you since 94 95. you had been informed by um, professor mills that if the 96 election uh, was won, VAT will be reintroduced. So he asked the IMF to hold on. And, and they held on. And the VAT was reintroduced. And then you left in 1999. Let's just deal with this and then we'll move on. In reintroducing the VAT uh, for the second time was the issue of a lower rate the only thing was that the only thing that worked uh no certainly not mm -hmm. um <clears throat> we go wiser um the vat team remember the vat service had been introduced yes so we had like a more staff okay and what happened was when the vat was cancelled they were retained under irs professor Mills was then a commissioner before mm -hmm. he became running mate uh and so we had a larger team but we also had a sharper communication sharper communication yes. the new board mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, which was chaired by Honorable. Okay, that's the interim before that mm -hmm. stage. But in the de redesign, mm -hmm. communication was given prominence. Okay. And the, <laughs> the, I'm smiling because the chairman of the, um, that committee was a certain deputy minister for information. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay. J.D. Mahama. J.D. Mahama, yes. Oh. <laughs> so, he, yeah, he said it. Okay. And then later when it was introduced and we had to intensify, he was helping Bespio became, one of Bespio, Gabra became he the was the minister. Of the he became the chairman of the board. Okay. After the reintroduction. Okay. Yes. So, so communication played a more mm. effective role. Mm. The rates, yes, it did a lot. But communication involving you know, the VAT, particularly for businesses. And one major decision was, was, was retained in the law that despite the cancellation of the VAT, I was mentioning the strength of the VAT, mm. all businesses that had registered and were due credit or refunds will be honored. Okay. So it was budgeted for. Okay. So businesses began to see, compared to the sales tax, that all this right. was a superior... Mm. You know, system. So mm. These were among the factors. Mm. You know, mm. yes. So you left for ten years to the IMF. Yes. What were you doing there? I remained in the fiscal affairs department. Uh, fiscal affairs. What yeah, which is there? a technical. We know the IMF for mm. those who come from the Africa department. We call them the um, <clears throat> regional department. So you have Asian department, African department, and mm. you know, yeah, Asia. And so um, I, and then you have the technical assistance departments mm. and the fiscal affairs department is one mm. for government budgeting the monetary department is one for central banking the statistics department uh, including some prominent Ghanaians who were there before I, I went mm. you know Chidi you know Dr. Uh, Chidi Chikata you are Dr. Uh, forgot it mm. uh, and, and quite a number of, and then mm. uh, of, obviously the most senior at the time was uh, uh, Dr. Paul Aqua. Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I met, I overlapped with him. Mm -hmm. But I remain in the fiscal affairs department and we did two things. And you were based where? In Washington. Okay. But we did two things. We went, we, on the invitation of a government, we would go and help with their tax administration and policy reforms as well as expenditure. Mm -hmm. So the, the division was made up. Uh, debt management and other, uh, and then we accompanied the, let's say, the mission chief mm -hmm. coming to, you know, to Ghana to mm -hmm. do uh, a review or to start a program. We would accompany them and we would look at, if you take the documentation, you will see elaborate description of what tax measures are to be implemented, mm -hmm. what you know, reforms had to be continued or slacking and the rest. So that's the work that we did. Mm. And then the third thing I did was to continue with my teaching, mm. <laughs> you know, at the IMF Institute, yes. So the IMF has an institute? Yes. In Washington? A very prominent one, yes. Oh, okay. The, so. In fact, the course is now online, and I recommend I put it on my ex Twitter for okay. people to just go online, especially for a lot of people have since told me that they've you know, so while you were working, you were teaching. Yeah. Yes. So, so why did you leave the IMF in 2009? Well, <laughs> oh, Samuel asked me to come back. Well, Mills called you? Yes. In 2009? When it became, yes. When he after, won the election? After, yes. Uh, before. Before he won there the was election? A, there was a casual conversation. I took it to be just casual. Okay. He was in Washington having... And then we started talking about the reforms, those that had stopped, you know, and all that. And so he said, uh, I'll find a way of you coming back to, you know, to help. Mm -hmm. And so initially I came to join the transition team. Okay. And then I was to be advisor and then change to deputy minister. Oh, so you were not going to be deputy minister. You were originally you were going to be an advisor. And that was one of the options I thought. That's what I discussed with my head of department, for mm -hmm. example, you know, because the natural thing would be is a technical assistance department, so the IMF could have seconded me. Oh, so you were still going to be in the employment of the IMF? But you would have been in employment, you yes. would have been reporting, but I thought that maybe they wanted something. So what changed? How did that change from advisor to now deputy minister? What I know is that Professor Mills 
you know, change the, the request. Okay. He changed the, what I thought was. So he offered the deputy minister position. So I had to discuss my family and, you know. Your family was in the States, were you? Yeah. Your wife and children? Yeah. How many children? Two. Two, okay. Yeah, one is special need. <laughs> okay. It is one of the reasons we actually oh. decided to go to this. Okay. At the time, it was very difficult to get help. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 I hope he's doing well. He's doing well, yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. So, so you agreed to be deputy minister to leave the IMF? Yes. Why? Um, well, honestly, there were periods when... You know, for example, what the one I know most, which didn't come public, was uh, before I left for the fund, after the VAT was introduced, uh, apparently I was being considered for deputy assistant regional minister. Oh. And then my <laughs> people would often ask me, why can't you, even once I was there, yeah. you know, MP and all that, you know, so. Um, Were you a kid, uh? Were you part of the revolution? Were you... You were in university and all that. Were you into all those uh, CDR, ACDR, PDC? Were you part of the revolution? That's how it's yes. <laughs> yes? Yes. I was in, in, what uh, way, in, in which way? In Vaz, I was, aside from Akrapoli, I was in the Nooks. I was, Nooks, I was treasurer and then also local Nooks. Oh, so you were in student politics? I was in student politics. Okay. Yes. But how was that linked to government? And then Kivas, mm -hmm. okay, it's, it's just a Kivas, uh, I was also in the local news. I was a uh, Kisihevo Hall treasurer, you know, and then, so, uh, local news. So you were in Cass? Kis, yeah, Cassford. Yeah, okay. Cassford. Uh, yeah, so you, 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 sing the, you sing the songs? <laughs> Do you sing the songs? Uh, not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Remember, All I'm right. a silent voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So whilst there, you were in local nooks and then? And then the universities were closed for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the Luther days and mm -hmm. the rest, yeah. So I was, it extended to me being actually the student and youth task force leader. Student and youth task force leader. Yeah. Which, which was linked the, to the regime. Which was linked to the regime, yes. Okay. Because when the structure the governor structure broke mm -hmm. initially the representatives before that touches military and others came mm. yeah students were leading as part of the cuckoo and other things so we were coordinating mm. you know yeah the political activities and the rest before the district chief executives were appointed and mm. you know, and uh, yeah <laughs> so you were kidder um well, uh, the older people in the NDC call me comrades, so yes. The, the older younger, people? Yeah, the younger people. The, young, the younger one is... Uh, they don't know about those uh, ones. Well, I say I'm, not, I'm not a politician. <laughs> but do you consider yourself a comrade, a kader, a person who had, you're, you're done, you're part of the revolution? Well, certainly. I'm, I mean, I've been in left of center thinking for, okay. you know, yes. Okay. And, you know, it's... It was a battle. I was telling, you know, my senior, you know, minister, one of my senior, senior reverend ministers, that it was a battle. Mm. You know, being left of center with all the things about them, you know. But then what set in my mind was liberation theology at the time. Okay. You know, uh, which came from the Catholicism. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. You know, so it was a big thing at the time. And so I found how religion could be used, you know, to serve you know, no, uh, social needs and all that. And I thought it was part of the mission of, mm. of the Christ, mm. you know, so. So, so, so <laughs> you had left in 99. You were part of some tax reforms. You were out for 10 years. You were observing the eight years of the J. Kufour rule. Um, how the... Uh, in fact, from the Rollins before yes, 2000. So, yes, so at least uh, two years of Rollins before uh, President Kufour came in. Uh, that's from 99. Um, so you had seen how the tax reforms had gone on. We had had a re-denomination. Yeah. Um, I think two years proud to, to you coming into office and all that. Yeah, uh, that was a monetary policy. Yes. <clears throat> so accepting to be deputy minister in 2009 um, and uh, Dr. Dufour. Yes. Had you had the opportunity of working with him earlier? 
I knew him, okay. but you know he had a stint in London. Yeah, okay. Yes, he had a stint in the yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean during the PM yes. right, as before he came back as yes. So yes, I knew him. Okay. You know, um you know, but more uh more of a governor gamma because um at the request of um, Victor, uh, the late Victor Selome, Deputy Minister, and uh, Mr. the late Mr. Now, I served on OMO. So that's my link with the, with the Central Bank. Open? open market operation. Okay. You know, where the tendering for bit, you know, uh, bills and things. And it was then that I knew quite a number of, you know, from Dr. Wampa, the current governor, yeah. you know, who was in research. You know, yeah, so I knew all of them alongside there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the economic recovery program. Okay. And, yeah. okay. So in 2009, when you were appointed deputy minister, um, what were the challenges at that time? What was the focus of your government at that time? The big one was that certain tax reforms had stopped. And by virtue of being in the fund and doing technical assistance, I knew what other countries you know, were doing. They were moving on. You know, for example, we had autonomy, and then we had the revenue agency's governing board. But the NRS itself was administrative institution. Revenue agency's governing board was enacted by law, but then the executive secretary did not have as much power as a commissioner general, mm -hmm. and it was like a compromise between the tax type and you know. Uh, if I worked on that before. Before leaving, with uh, the consultant at the time, Mr. Uh, Asante, mm. who is an accountant. Mm. But observing countries had moved on, and in two big ways, um, the countries were strengthening their revenue authority so that they can have strong focus on taxation, including the UK. Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, it used to be separate, Customs mm. were separate. Mm. You know, the Ghana was not moving in that direction. And I, we, we moved, we, we had a compromise. But RGB was not, did not the, the, sec, sec, the general secretary didn't have that much powers. Okay. Much of Africa had moved on and established revenue authorities. I spoke about Mr. Labisi, who mm. played a role, in, uh, apart from Rwanda and Uganda, in Ethiopia, mm. you know, as well. He wasn't commission general, but he played a very major role under mm. crown agents. So that was one of the things that we missed. So you see that GRE was established in 2009. You know, being a tax professional, Professor Mills knew as a candidate things that we needed to do because he himself was doing teaching and consulting. And, mm. and then the second one was countries where I mentioned the VAT invoice. So I go in and I do examination of VAT. And remember the VAT is purchase invoice, sales invoice. Then income tax comes in and use the same invoice. Income tax is sales minus purchases, profit, expenses, and the rest. So countries were merging, you know, the two, moving from the tax type mm. to what we call functional. Mm. So they would put the, the two together. Many countries have moved. We didn't, you know, do that. You saw that we also did that as part of the GRA, mm. you know, reforms. Mm. And then the big thing was automation or digitalization. Uh, you remember single window, you know, uh, or West Blue, mm. you know, customs. What has lacked for the last seven years again is the domestic. Because you, you automate the domestic to interface with customs. And that gives you better compliance. So why didn't you do it? No, we were, that was phase two. That was to come in. So phase one was what? Phase one was the, major, was the creation of GRA, mm -hmm. you know, the measure of uh, um, uh, internal revenue service and vast service to become the domestic tax division of, you know. And that involved a lot. So the two big things that were left, were, and then automation, mm -hmm. which we did. And then we started revamping the tax law. Automation is simply digitalization. digitalization. Yeah, this is what we call it digitalization, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the phase two was, you know, when you merge IRS and VAT, you have staff who are doing only VAT, and you have staff who are doing only, you know, uh, income tax, income tax, right? But you are merging, mm -hmm. and and they so they have to 
do a certain kind of cross fertilization mm -hmm. to make sure that you know so training elements you know merging their offices sometimes into one big office only physically mm -hmm. uh, but you need to support all this with you know an automated system because remember one example the tax that customs VAT that customs collects right for the importer is the one as we discussed is the invoice which they will use to claim input as credit mm -hmm. if they know there's no system they can overstate the, the credit in their tax return and pay lesser you know of the two so for example in our example instead of declaring them i pay 10 you know and my invoice is clearly showing i can say that i pay 12. And in that case instead of uh, 10 minus uh, 12 minus 10 it becomes 12 minus 11. But if you interface, that data is available to the domestic tax division and they can cross check when you file your returns. And that's a better way of compliance, you know, through the national identification number and through your tax office number, mm. you know, which is on the customs, you know. So it's not just an, an issue for, and then it's not just an issue of, you know, um, uh, creating, automating. It is the use of the data, the information, to enhance compliance, as, as we say. Well, you are supposed to, to do your taxes voluntarily, mm -hmm. voluntary compliance. But when you fail, that's when the enforcement comes in. But when the systems, particularly in the modern era, are not talking to each other, so that before you go to the field, for example, when VAT was automated, the VAT was a not income tax. Mm -hmm. So the VAT service, before they went on visit in the field, they would, they would print, and we had access to the customs, so they would print, you know, the information about it. So by the time they come to your office, they are done their work in the office before they come to the field, mm -hmm. and talking confidently, you know, about disparities, you know. So that was also not done. And then on the expenditure side, the giftness, which was to improve, you know, the quality of expenditure. And, and do expenditure control. We also go into a phase two, particularly to monitor arrears and the rest. We run out of money. We we'll, we'll we'll speak about GIFMIS. Yes. So you you talk about the the um, the measure of yes. all those um, uh, IRS and VAT, tax agencies and, and all that yes. as one unit, GRA. Yes. And then you speak about automation or digitalization, whichever. We started with one. customs. So you started with a customs one. Yes. And you said phase two was to be domestic revenue. Domestic, yes. Which was supposed to start when? 2017. 2017. Because we had started talking to the World Bank and who were financing. Has that been done? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. the, I, what I know is that tender has been done. But, and it's in the IMF regards a conditionality. <laughs> oh, the current IMF? Yeah, program, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. That we should do that? Yes. Okay. So many of the reforms are coming back. Giftness, strength, the accounts payable. Many of the reforms that we, we initiated, which have been stored, they are in the IMF program. So let, let's go to giftness. At, at which point did you come up with giftness and why? Well, remember, I was also in the fiscal affairs department and I observed what was going on as, in terms of expenditure control, even though I was in many taxes. As an accountant, I took an interest in some of the things that were going on. I read you know, they, they, they normally circulate. So when the accountants in that division go to help countries, and Ghana was one. Remember, we had proof map. What was that? The uh, public, gift miss was called proof map under the PNDC. Okay. And then a short while into the Kufa administration. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, PU, PU stands for public. Mm -hmm. uh, financial management reform program. Okay. That's proof map. Mm -hmm. So I knew about proof map and I knew it had stopped. So when I became deputy minister in charge of the budget, you know, we decided to move on and we approached the World Bank. It is, and then we called it GIFMIS. The World Bank has a general system they call IFMIS, Integrated Financial Management Information System, mm -hmm. which actually integrates revenue. Because you know your fiscal starts with revenue before you come to expenditure. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we are the gene for Ghana. Okay. And that's why we have giftness. Okay. So the World Bank was promoting this and financing. 
You know, so we started exponential reforms. What, what, was, what was Give Me supposed to do? Why did we need it? For example, uh, mm-hmm. one example, uh, why the first purpose is automation. Okay. Automation of what? The request, one, you automate the budget itself. When the budget is read, okay. the allocation you make to, you know, uh, ministries, departments, agencies, MMDAs, you know, it's supposed to be automated. Mm-hmm. And you had a, a classification system or a chart of accounts which gave, which classified each of the ministries, each of the departments, they have numbers. And so when they are making a request, so you download the estimates and the allocation, the ceiling, you download it into, from the budget system into the controller system. Okay. That's one. Mm-hmm. Then we used to have paper, a lot of paper, mm-hmm. where the request for payment by contractors would start from the Ministry of say, Roads and then come to you know, the Ministry of Finance. And sometimes the minister will have about five you know, files you know, full of requests that are come. We call them warrants. All right? We automated that as well. Mm-hmm. So you as a contractor, you know, will just, you know, send your request electronically. Ministry of Rules, you know, will send it. And then payment will begin. So you didn't have to track and come and follow up from office to office. And, you know, the officials will be looking at the thing electronically and then transmitting it, you know, to the controller. Mm-hmm. The control element comes in, mm. where it was a bit unpopular, mm-hmm. in that as you spent, because you have downloaded the budget ceilings, it reduces your, and it gives you information. Mm. You know, so it reduces, you know, a bit of corruption, you know, where contracts are overstated and the rest, you know, so ministers and, uh, because they want to optimize their budget, and then it's, it just went away. So they became more vigilant because they knew what was going down, mm. you know, and the rest. Mm. So that's the element. So you are automating that whole process. And you are providing information to the audit, internal audit, monitoring, you know, and evaluation. And it's providing feedback as to whether you are meeting your budget or you are, you are you know, running over. Mm. And then you can have a conversation. But we didn't go deep into that. We had, the system had been put in place. And... We were piloting it from 2015 to 2016 before, you know, we lost. So that's the, so it's a system, it's a budget system with the accounting system. And one of the things was to interface with Bank of Ghana, the coding. Yeah, the coding. We coded, in fact, we coded the expenditures, you know, so every table, office table is an office table. So it had a code across. So what distinguishes Ministry of Finance you know, table, office table from Ministry of Trade is a code for Ministry of Finance in combination with the table. Mm. That will give you the value of mm. tables, you know. So that type of coding, you know, was done. And then when the payment is done, we were going to interfere. We hadn't gone with that. Apply our codes to the Bank of Ghana codes because Central Bank has a very elaborate coding system so that we can monitor the payments. It will fed back to the controller. Mm. That way, Real time, you are controlling your budget overall. But the big missing link, you know, which we were going to do was arrears were just calculated as six months average, three to six months of bills that are unpaid in the Ministry of Finance. But you didn't tackle the contracts that have been awarded, contracts that are yet to be certified, contracts that, you know. So we started a contract database when I was a deputy. And that's accounts payable. Mm-hmm. which was to be part of the giftness. So all of these, the reporting and the refinements, was a phase two. So we had a revenue modernization phase one, and then we moved into two, and then we had a giftness phase one, and then another important thing that we did was, because the controller was the one making the payment, everybody came to the controller, you know, to mm-hmm. follow up on their payment, New recruits came to the controller <laughs> to follow up their payments because they are sent in their transfers to their department. Sorry, they are uh, take uh, nurses and, and teachers. You know, they had applied paper and everything, you know, and they waited three months, six months. And they haven't received their, you know, appointment letter. 
but they were teaching, right? Mm. And they were not on the payroll, right? Because until the, the controller or the Minister of Finance received the postings from Minister of Health and the rest, it doesn't form part of the payroll, right? So what we did was the controller is not a human resource manager for government. The human resource manager for government is the Office of Head of Civil Service and the Public Services Commission. So we work with the French. We got a lot of technical assistance also from DFEED in putting all of these things together, USAID. So we work with the French, and they put in a human resource management information system for the pub- under the Public Services Commission. Because they were the ones who did the postings. They are the ones who, and all of that was manual. The old establishment secretariat. So that also was just being completed at the time, you know, we left office. So that the HRMI system, the payroll element will speak to the controller. And so once the transfer is done, or you are steady leave, or you, you retire, you resign, you are taking off the payroll straight away electronically to improve the system. Were all these parts of the transition of 2020, 2016, and were they part of your handing over notes? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. They were part of the handing over notes, including presentations that we made. Have they been continued? Some have been continued. Uh, I know the HRMI system is working. I know the Hyperion, which is the budget system, is working. I think the main difficulty is in passing all transactions through the GIFMIS. Are you suggesting that not all transactions go through GIFMIS? Well, that was a report that came out. And, therefore, and then the accounts payable. Remember the backlog of contracts, which was about $13 billion when we were leaving office, has mm. shot up to about $77 billion, thanks to the disclosures to the IMF. Mm. You're right. So... That part I know, you know, has been stopped. Mm-hmm. But, but the system, you know, in its form continues. So, so you were Deputy Minister of Finance. And we're told that for the last NDC government, those were the glory days. 14% growth, even real sector growth of 10%, 11%, and all those things. Oh, yeah. Yes, I mean, oil and non-oil. <laughs> I mean, we're doing so well. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, and then you became a full minister, and then the economy takes a nosedive. The economy would have taken a nosedive because, remember, one, even in 2009, the global financial crisis. 2009. Yes. Okay. The global it started 2007 or 2007. So. Okay. So the impact, mm-hmm. even though it was U.S. and whatever, the impact was, you know, also felt globally. And it was the biggest crisis after the Depression. It's only COVID that has that beat it. So we're feeling that impact. In fact, part of, you know, and a lot of research was being done on that. Then, in our case, there was a single spine. Single spine. 2009. You remember the wage overrun yes. and the years. And then towards the end of the How impactful was single spine? It was huge because um, what it did was that the, the reality was out of line with the, what was envisaged. What was envisaged was within the budget. I think there was a design flaw or some research flaw. And so when we started the payment and the, what we call the migration, the liability became huge, far bigger than could be expected. Mm. And so by the time the police, the big institutions, you know, some of which were paid earlier, um, we realized that we were in trouble. There was no way. Mm. So initially, we, you know, because of oil, there was some revenue coming in. Uh, but that's in 2011. Uh, the suspe- its implementation was suspended in 2010 and. Uh, Dr. Dufo, and then, and then we had some borrowing space, so we were borrowing. By 2013, we realized that we couldn't uh, continue borrowing, you know, to pay the single spine. So remember, there was uh, uh, discussions at who with labor, and we spread it. But the long and short is that we had these setbacks also, right? We had these setbacks. And then on the debt side, apart from the bonds that we had issued, there were bonds that were issued further back to the Rollins administration, further back, no bonds, uh, borrowing. 
uh, because the bonds started, you know, in NS. Yeah, bonds, because the Bank of Ghana was issuing the bonds. Mm. Um, so there were those, and then the new. So by 2013, 2014, the biggest by 2014, we were three years away. This is one of the big issues. We were three years away from the first sovereign bond and the successive coup for maturing. 750 million US dollars. In addition to the bonds that we were, we were introducing, we were also implementing. And then we realized that there was no way we could cough 750 million in three years' time. That's when we set up the sinking fund, mm-hmm. you know, which was part of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, which said that if you cap the stabilization fund, you must use it for debt service or for contingency fund. You know, so the what I said was actually the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, you know, which took about a year plus to, to debate in Parliament. And then there was a team that went around, you know, the whole country and uh, one of the advisors, uh, Dr. Uh, Abakutu Fuo, you know, then he went around and he had worked under the Kufu administration, so he had some. But we fashioned out the Petroleum Revenue Management Act. I'm mentioning that because in terms of reforms, the Petroleum Revenue Management Act was designed as a new flow into the budget to tackle areas where we're having difficulties already. And the main one was that we were borrowing and borrowing and paying on the interest, including the sovereign bonds. Right? The domestic bonds that we also started increasing, three years, five years, and the rest. And just pushing the principal away. So we set up the sinking fund to say, let us start reducing the principal. Otherwise, you will catch up with us. And we're going to go into heat peak again. You see, so that was a major initiative. So one of the solutions. But the petroleum revenue management principle, another principle was that cocoa prices today are 10000 Yes. Right. If you sell at 10,000, but we are, there was, there's now talk about hedging. That's mm. a disadvantage of hedging. Mm. You know, we sold forward, mm. so now we are not able to take advantage mm. of that. But that, let's put that aside. Mm. But the principle is that we started with petrol, with petroleum, which we were going to apply to cocoa board, was when the, your commodity price goes up, right, put some of the money aside because it will come down. <laughs> Mm. It will come down someday. Mm. Now, when you have peace and there's no global crisis, continue putting some money aside because crises are inevitable. Domestic, it will come. Mm. Drought, <laughs> it will come. Mm. Uh, because you don't control rainfall. Or even excessive rain, it will come. Like the breach of the, uh, you know, the spillage mm. you know, recently. But we stopped. So... You build your stabilization, that's where the stabilization funds come in. You build it and increase it when conditions are favorable. And then when you face challenges, then you go to parliament and then take part of the money you have put aside. So the first time we took money out is when we started in 2014. The first time we took money out of the contingency fund was during the Kwame Nkrumah fire disaster and the, and the flooding in 2015. Yes. It was, it was a big amount of money, right? And then the stabilization fund, we didn't take it. You know, and then we kept the stabilization fund and used part to set up the sinking fund and part to set up the contingency fund. Mm. By the way, these are constitutional provisions. So since 2012, you know, we hadn't done it. Mm. So these are counter cyclical measures. Now, it is depleted on account of COVID. In fact, so when COVID struck, if you remember, the government went to parliament to take out 250 million US dollars. That was the first amount that was taken out from the stabilization fund before we got a COVID loan and others. Mm. Now, question, if you put 250 million aside from one oil field, and now you have three, could you have put aside 750 million? Yes. Right? So how can you do it? And if you had put 750 million aside, you wouldn't have gone to the fund. So with your for one, one billion, with your one oil well, 
you set aside 250, yes. which we fell on when COVID struck. 250 plus, yes. Now, now we have three oil fields, yes. but we have zero. We depleted it. We, okay. didn't, we didn't add to it, and then we depleted the balance that was left with mm. one oil field. Mm. You know, but what I'm driving at is that this whole thing about weaning yourself of the IMF, right? It takes serious planning, right? So where I was going to land is, so if you have three oil fields, let's say pro rata, it's more, but pro rata. If you had put 250, 250, 250, each oil field, that's 750. You go and borrow 250 for a fund, you don't, call, you don't borrow 1 billion. Mm -hmm. when, when you face your crisis. Mm -hmm. You see, so this is, and, and let me say that these are some of the exposures and things which you are, you, 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 you're the benefits of exposure in working with the fund. Because before the fund, actually, I had worked with HID in Eastern Europe, in the countries that were acceding to the EU. You know, so for example, Vice President was talking about uh, Estonia. Estonia. Yeah, they have structures. So you don't just follow them. And then the EU, small population, right? And they get a lot of, you know, uh, uh, inflows from the EU for their infrastructure and whatever. Yours is broken down. So you don't go and all of a sudden change your tax regime because Estonia is doing it without looking at your know, condition. But the point I'm making, I was making is that having worked there, every emerging economy which has succeeded, every you know, brick country that has a student have these structures. Mm. You know, they have these structures. A fund to repay, you know, your debt, proper debt management as we put in the Public Financial Management Act, relations and everything. And so, and, and, the, and the capacity is there in the Ministry of Finance. All you need was, well, you know, enhancing. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. It exists. And I know it for a fact because I work with, you know, some of the staff who are still there. So why did we keep borrowing, you know, without, you know, the flows? And we cut this. We didn't, when we cut the stabilization fund, if I would cap it, you know, because also because of the fall in crude oil prices in 2015 when we read the budget, going to 2016, right, to take some money out. With two additional oil fields, the cap was never, you know, uh, removed. So that more will flow into it. Because the benefit of the funds flowing to the stabilization fund included the sinking fund. That's the source of the sinking fund. But we kept borrowing, and we didn't have the sinking fund to be paying down mm. until we crashed. Mm. Now, now <laughs> you, you, you have been accused of taking advantage of all these reforms and our problems and others in leading... Um, some enactments or legislations that made you the finance minister and then subsequent finance ministers more of a, a super minister or a senior minister or a prime minister i.e. through the public financial management act, act and give me an order such that even when ministers or ministries have been given the allocations in the budget and all that they still need it um, the finance minister had a final authority on, on, on a lot of these things. I don't know if you have heard of this. That the law, if you read all the laws, financial management, everything, it positions the finance minister as, as even more powerful than, than, than the vice president. I don't think so. Uh, because everything is subject to cabinet. There's nothing which is in a law which is not subject to cabinet. Mm. And then, uh, secondly, there are definitions for spending officers and, you know, uh, about three definitions, which include ministers and chief directors. Mm. And the third point is, um, some of this argument is coming, you know, from the MPP. Because remember, the PFMA, we never got to implement it. Okay. So we never really got to implement it. Mm. So people who say that, you know, are going back to... The, what I, I described, the, mm. um, uh, the giftness reforms, the initiative to, which we implemented for barely a year, the initiative to put 
the ceilings electronically in the system so that when you are, you are spending, we give you information. We didn't touch the ceilings. We are only telling you as a minister that, hey, look, your allocation is 200 million. That's why we went to committee. And we all say we want to remain within the watch it because you've already spent 300 million out of 500. So you said so. They say that because we don't have so much. So at every point in time, there are competing demands. So you have, let's say, 20 ministries. They all have their allocations. But you don't have all the money at a particular time. So there's a need for prioritization. Absolutely. And who can get what when. And that is where the finance minister becoming a senior or super minister comes in. No, it never overrides the power of the sector minister to be in control of his budget. No, he's in control of his budget. But you, as a person who's in charge of the consolidated fund, I mean, you sit somewhere where all the but fund, that tax it. revenue, everything comes. So you know that maybe at this particular time, we only have 200 million cities. Trade wants this. Agri wants this. Labor and employment wants that. Who, who decides on who should get what at what time? I consider the Ministry of Finance as a room in cash management, right? Because remember, you're also looking at money that should go to pay down debt. And you are looking at money that should go to statutory funds. So it's a broad, it's a broad thing. So automation rather helps you see the picture better, right? We did a treasury single account. Government monies that were, I'm surprised at some of these things. Government monies that were sitting in banks and other places, which were being used sometimes to buy government's own. You know, when we did a treasury single account, that's how we did a zero financing. It's one of the reasons. Mm. We stopped all of that because it's government money. You can't use it, right? And we rather, you know, if you want to use because we don't need the money immediately, you pay the interest, right? Mm. So we were in better control. But a lot of what is being spoken about now, I would attribute to it to the reforms more than the law, because much of it were in the Financial Administration Act. <laughs> mm. Much of it were already in the Financial Administration Act, mm. right? Mm. The role of the minister, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to management of the fiscal, it's inevitable, you know, that the minister and his deputies for finance are charged. What if we were reckless, you know, uh, or we ignored prudent, you know, management? And mind you, we set up the sinking fund. Instead of setting up the sinking fund and started paying down and whatever, in fact, on the old basis, our debt was inching, you know, uh, slightly above 70%. Mm. You know, but it showed that we were reducing the rate of borrowing. So on course, and that's why on a new basis, it's just 57 percent. Mm. So um, no, I would take issue with some of those mm. those things. Um, uh, the reforms and arrests in those particular that particular area was short lived. So mm. I wouldn't also, you know, say that you know uh, some of the perceptions, you know, by the my colleague ministers and arrest, you know, uh, excuse me to say nonsense or no, no. Because it was a reform mm. that was taking place. Mm. It was new. And so the awareness and things you know, were coming. But in terms of liquidity, apart from the 2015 bond, apart from the 2015 bond that we did, which we used to refinance the uh, single spine, doom so, uh, the 200 million went to refinance the uh, his SNC force bond so that we can you know, pay you know, oh, more systematically over a 15-year period instead of we meeting that which was stopped. Uh, apart from those, all the three bonds that we did, they were cash. It's not like going to China for uh, or the World Bank for money, and then they will tell you, you finish this, one tranche will be paid, two tranches, sometimes up to five tranches before you. We had the cash. This is our own money. It was in, and, and I would ask the question, how did we do other infrastructure mm. if, we, if we didn't put money in the system? Mm. And the infrastructure were not for consumption because we took the, you know, the principle that you know, we must use those monies for infrastructure you know, so that we can reap the benefits of the repayment, mm. you know, either through growth or like airport tax, which we use the, uh, to... to to build Terminal 3, mm. which is self-financing. Mm. So, so, yeah. so, so you're a finance minister. 
You didn't have uh, COVID. You didn't have Russia, Ukraine. Yet, your growth figures were not good. Crude oil prices fell. What? Crude oil prices mm -hmm. fell. Let, let me finish, let me finish <laughs> with the question okay. that you can answer. Yes. Your growth rates were not good. Your inflation rates were not good. Your, um, the stability of your currency was not that good. We ended your tenure with almost four CDs to a dollar. Um, you couldn't pay teacher and training allowances. There were backlog of um, teachers and nurses and others who had to be employed. You were not giving the warrants for the employment. We saw a lot of uh, uh, agitation and picketing and all that. There was a group called uh, Unemployed Graduates Association and all that. You were also supervising minister for power for almost a year. We had excruciating doom so. I mean, when people talk about Secretary, the finance minister, it looks like a lot of the things that come to mind are not uh, positive. Um, every minister for finance faces challenges. Every minister for finance faces challenges. And what I can say is that, you know, if you compared three oil firms to one, and the situation we are in now, I think, relatively speaking, we can be said to have done better because, one, we also face challenges. Remember, right from Dr. Dufour's time, the biggest challenge that, you know, he faced, you know, was a uh, single spine, which continued until we met Labour in 2013. And we had to be borrowing, right? Then there was a breach of, you said doing so. Let's go to the history of doing so. Mm -hmm. It was a breach of the pipeline which disrupted the supply of gas from Nigeria, the West Africa gas pipeline. That, that's, that's the main cause of doing so. You know, which, for which we were told it will be repaired. It will be repaired. And uh, he said, he says, he says, you know, got fed up and he said, fine, let's find our own solution. So Car Power and Mary and others came in. And they came in ahead of the repair. So by the time the repair came, power was being stabilized. And, you know, even consider that we, we, we resolved them so. Mm. So I think we should be defending some of these things, you know, I mean, relatively speaking, mm. right? And go to the, you know, the, the causes of some of these things. Mm. After single spine was not, was not the nearest policy. Single mm. spine was just an experiment, not tested, you know, and then civil servants were told that it would be implemented. Did the new president have to renege on it? Right? It was suspended for a year. And even after suspension for a year, huge borrowing and huge management of resources had to go in. And we didn't get and some of the bonds that we started paying down, the World Bank refinancing money, went to stretch out some of these things, as I said. But the worst was the phone, you know what? We couldn't reach the 120,000 barrels. It was just around 70,000 barrels, the average of 110 to 120. You know, I mean, two crude prices. We prepared a 2016 budget with uh, $39 per barrel. I was reading the budget in 2015. First reading, crude oil prices crashed to $40 per, per barrel and came down to about 30. And so by March 2016, we were back in Parliament trimming the budget. Because there was no way. Because our debt was going up. There was no way we could have resolved it with borrowing. Right? And then we were in a fund program. And despite all that, we managed. You know, we have the best record in the last 10 years when it comes to deficit, debt, you know, and all those things. What do you mean by that? Of course, we, we ended our deficit mm -hmm. in 2016. It was 6.1. Mm -hmm. I mean, forget about 8.3 or whatever. The president corrected it. Mm. They were just using... You know, the arrears we were compiling mm. to give the impression that we had, you know, sorry, the contract we were mm. here. Our debt on a new business is 57%. Right? Today we are 100%. You, di you didn't have COVID. And then you we did zero finance. You didn't have COVID. You didn't have Russia, Ukraine. You see, I told you that we had, you know, the after effects of all this is the domestic wars. Mm. If you underestimate, you see, the, the, <laughs> the issue is this. If you underestimate the Rare cause of doom so, and you belittle it, 
that what is the real not, cause? That's what I'm saying. Yes. That part of the problems we face. Mm -hmm. If you underestimate a crisis, a crude oil price is crashing. Mm -hmm. Right? It crashed. It affects, you know. If you underestimate, you know, the breach of the pipeline, despite even the trouble, later trouble, you know, was in, it could have been worse. These are crises. Yes, they are not as big as COVID. But if you underestimate my little crisis, you won't be prepared for the big one. And that's how come when the big one struck, right, you didn't have 750 million. That's why three of us. And that's why when the big one struck, you have no excuse. After getting about 6 billion, including the stabilization fund, to resolve, you know, doom so. And you couldn't resolve it. I could enumerate them for you. Mm -hmm. Some were loans. COVID loan, 1 billion. SDI, 1 you're billion. You're talking about uh, monies we got as a result of COVID. To resolve COVID. Okay. The COVID crisis. Okay. The reason we got them was to help us resolve the COVID crisis. Okay. And I'm saying that no matter how, what's the size of Ghana's economy? And so no matter how big that crisis, 6 billion, no government. We got $6 billion. Yes. Okay. Equivalent. Okay. Because somewhere in cities. Okay. <laughs> I can, I say one billion, mm. IMF, mm. one billion, another billion, SDR, mm. IMF, World Bank, we all know by now, they gave about, what, 750 to 900 or so. Mm. Our African Development Bank, that's another one billion. Mm. Bank of Ghana, 1.7 mm. billion US dollars, stabilization fund. 300 you know, billion US dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then even our own jobs at the airport, mm -hmm. where the money goes, there are our own jobs mm -hmm. if you have to travel. Mm -hmm. You know, we pay, mm -hmm. right? And I have not yet mentioned what other development partners gave us. Mm -hmm. So, conservatively, so what excuse do you have? Assuming that I give even the benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. you know, that yes, COVID was severe, which I said it was, mm -hmm. the severest. Six billion. I mean, it's, it's not small. We're talking dollars. We're mm. not talking cities, equivalent. Mm. Mm. Right? So there's no reason. And then remember, and it's the fund program, and the IMF managing director repeated it. Mm. You know, it's here. Most recently, severe external shocks compounded pre existing mm. fiscal and debt vulnerabilities. Mm. It's the IMF speaking. So long before. The reason we couldn't resolve with all these monies is that they were pre-existing. In fact, if you look at the Article 4, IMF, 2019, it revised the deficit figures. The 4.7 or 4.9 was revised to 7%. The 5.3, I, I believe, was revised to 7.2%, which is the calculation we were making. Mm -hmm. The IMF, and these are the pre-existing pre conditions. So the deficit, the debt, you remember the bailout costs being put in footnotes and all those things? Mm. They were all part of the, this, the, the issue. Mm. So the fact that time has lapsed does not make these things. And to date, the fund is talking about pre existing conditions. It has repeated it several times. It repeated it in the staff report. It repeated it, you know, by the IMF money, uh, sorry, the executive board, you know. So they are now letting us know that this blaming COVID and Ukraine and whatever, we had problems already. That's mm. what the pre existing means. Mm. And the web managing director mentioned it mm. when she was here. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. So <laughs> let's let's so how come you had a net freeze on employment? You couldn't employ people. You had a backlog of nurses, teachers. You couldn't even pay teacher training allowance. You, you see, couldn't pay nursing training allowance. You see, this is the the point I was making. Because the final stop is the controller. Right? Everybody looked to the controller and everybody came to the controller and the Minister of Finance. But if I didn't have your appointment letter, am I going to pay? Mm. Right? If I didn't have your posting, am I going to pay? Because then the Auditor General will come and the controller has no basis for making those payments. One of the measures we took, you know, and this is not new, is continuing and it's become even worse. But one of the measures we took, which was seriously distorted by the current administration, was that we said, I called the controller, and we got permission, you know, from the Office of President. And we said, look, the teachers and nurses who have been posted already, we know them. 
The list is there. The only thing is that they have been working and they are not received because we haven't gotten their credentials. So let us pay them salary advance of three months. You see where the three months is coming? Let's pay them salary advance for three months. Right. The, the narrative out there is that they had worked for two years, some an, three years, and then you decided that you would pay them three months' salary for no, the two was, or three years they had worked. That was an MPP discussion. That was a, and it, was, it actually applied to you know, those new, who are new postings. Because as for the old postings, it's, it's a long time. It's currently, it's a thing which we were resolving with the HRMI system and the interface and whatever, because we are dealing with paper. Somebody who is in the village has to send it to the district, from the district to the region. And the region, and along the way, those who can grease palms would go and grease and fast track, you know, their own. How about if you didn't have it? But well, let me, so what we said was that let's pay, you know, the budget of teachers and nurses and doctors. Let's pay them a salary in advance, right? Because by then we, we had done the traditional account, there was some liquidity. So that when their authorization comes, then we would offset it and take the money and pay them the net. And this was also distorted. Mm. That, you know, we, we, we have decided to pay only three months and forget about the arrears and other things. And yeah, you know, consent teachers association. And then we explained it. I did a media briefing still on the website. So that's the humanitarian act, right? But the right, you know, to the teacher was completely distorted. Mm. You know, well, and unfortunately, by, by you know, some of the teachers themselves. Wh why did you decide to, to stop paying uh, nursing and teacher training allowance? Oh, that was a, that was a major decision that was taken. Mm. And the rationale is that they are tertiary institutions. Okay. Right? And the second reason is that, you know, youth schools and all these things were coming. Right? And even the tertiary expansion. You know, and if you say the tertiary institutions, what has that got to do with allowance? Because in principle, tertiary institutions took loans, so okay. we were transitioning them to loans. Okay. Yeah, for okay. you know, equality, equity, and whatever. Mm -hmm. But also, if you transition them to loans, right? Then the budget allocation is not a constraint for admission. Okay, so, so, so it, it removes the quota system. Exactly. Okay. You know, maybe not completely, but transitionally as it went along, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, because you had to pay the teachers and whatever. We had, you know, the challenges, but at least it starts removing the quota system. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you channel some of those resources rather into the, you know, uh, uh, the loan fund, you know, trust. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the rationale. Mm -hmm. I think President Mama has explained this. Times, but of course, it was against his support. Okay, so I raised an issue, and we'll probably try and, and, and round up with, with, with that one. You are a taxman through and through, so you I'm a PFM, I'm an accountant. Okay, so I do expenditure as well. Okay, so, so, but for, for many of us, we're taxman, VAT, taxman, taxman, so you eat, drink, sleep, taxation. So you become finance minister, even as deputy, to become finance minister. And your obsession is with how you can tax us and tax us and milk us dry. No. Remember the levies, right? There were, we, we introduced two types of levies, right? One, where, when we entered a fund program, which is something that has been done from the Rollins administration. As part of the measures to take the economy out of this problem, you introduce temporary taxes. There are two. Temporary import duty and then fiscal stabilization levy. At the end of the IMF program, they lapsed. So the fact that we introduced them and were kept, they should have lapsed. You know, in 2017, 2018, when the IMF program ended, it's the current administration that kept them. Mm. But the tradition has always been, even when the, the one that Professor Mills did in Chudu, they lapse. They, they, they always lapse. So you can't, they can't, nobody can blame us for it. So, Two, yes. The majority of levies, the, the second levy that we, we introduced was ESLA. 
which was also to lapse in three to five years. It was a current government that collateralized it. It is a current government that did not apply the money you know, to pay the IPPs, and today we have done so and other things. Because the, the amount that was estimated and the insistence of the opposition now in power was that they were not giving us a penny more. So we had to calculate the liability to the penny. That's the 2.2 billion. And we started dutifully paying VRA, you know, uh, the VRA subsidies that were owing, but we brought the banks from whom they are borrowed, you know, to know that we were paying VRA. And they created a fund. We brought the IPP. In fact, we gave a term suite of 500 million US dollars to the current administration from Africa to pay the IPPs. That was the phase two. You gave them that? Yes, the term sheet. It wasn't that. Mm. <laughs> yes, so, so I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't buy into this narrative that we introduced. The bulk of the levies from COVID okay. levy to let's, let's watch. Let's watch His Excellency the Vice President describing your tax regime and what ought to be done. I'm sure that is perhaps a video that you have seen over and over again. The issue of uh, from taxation to production. production. Yes. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm, I'm sure that they'll, they'll, they'll get a video. Really, yes. But essentially, he was talking about how you've taxed businesses and individuals out, and it looks like any, 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 for want of a better expression, any, any thoughts that came to mind, you will tax. No. So you were taxing condoms and cutlasses and. Well, the condoms and cutlasses was it never made it into the law. It was. But you know, when you are doing this, it's a big custom tariff, right? Mm. So sometimes, you know, you have to go into the very nitty-gritty, the last, you know, vestige. So it was a mistake that was uh, dictated a committee. It never made it to the floor of the, you know, of the house. But mm. then they went, you know, along and the narrative... Let's watch the vice president. <laughs> Kufuado has made it very clear that his government is going to build a globally competitive economy. Uh, we have not really been thinking global, uh, um, and, and this is what we need to do, that we have to understand that we are in competition with other countries, and, and investment moves from country to country, uh, and we, so we have to think global. And so, you know, the Nanaku Fuado policy, which he stated, uh, was, is just basically to build the most people-friendly and the most business-friendly economy in Africa. This is the goal that we are going to try to do, the most people-friendly and the most business-friendly. The tax issue um, is a major issue because if you are so you know, fixated on revenue, you will essentially end up hurting your production. And, and so if you go back into history, you study the economic history of United States, Germany, England, all of them have used the tax, you know, um, policy to encourage production. Mm. And this is why we are saying that, I mean, <coughs> today you have a situation in Ghana, <coughs> unbelievable situation, when businesses are out on strike. Businesses who should be selling mm. are out on strike. Well, why are they out on strike? Because they've been overburdened by taxes. You know, and if you don't take care, you'll be chasing the tax revenue and killing businesses. And when you kill businesses, it means you are causing unemployment. And so if you go back, this is why Nana Kofuado is saying, you know, we need to mobilize financial resources. So why are you mm. going to be imposing VAT on financial services? It doesn't make sense in a country which has got a very large unbanked population and we want people to bank. We will abolish that, mm. he says. We will abolish import duty on all raw materials because that has been a, a policy that will help production. Let the businesses produce. Let them make profit. And and when they make profit and employ people, we will get income taxes and we will get corporate taxes. So you don't go ahead to kill the business. No, let them bring in the raw materials. Let them produce. Then you will tax, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, and, and, and I think that you, then you have a government where you have cutlasses being taxed, condoms being taxed, <laughs> you know, and even savings. There was a 1% imposition on savings, which was later withdrawn. On investments, yes. On investments. Mm, mm. 
Okay. Which was later. I mean, even to think about it was was it's, well. It's, it's been suspended. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's so been suspended. I mean, I mean, but even to think abolished. about it. Mm. Oh, it's now abolished. Yes. Is it? Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. but even to think about, about it, it. Mm. it doesn't. It just uh, questions who are making these policies. I mean, but I isn't mean, it just it, another way? Another um, you way know, of raising it, revenue. Well, yes, but when you become desperate, this is what happens. That when you've mismanaged the economy mm. into this hole, then anything sounds great to you because you don't have any option. The MPP will shift the focus of economic policy away from taxation to production. So we are going to move away from taxation to production. Taxation. All right, so, so that's the, the, the vice president who's also chair of the economic management team um, then telling us what they will do. First of all, um, telling us about how you got it wrong and what they will do differently. Now, before you answer this, I want to also show you the verdict of the immediate past finance minister on your output. How would you respond to your critic who say that you don't have a message? You know, when um, a government moves from 9 billion CDs worth of debt mm. that we leave them in 08, and by 2012 they are at 36 billion, and then by this year they are at 105 billion, how could there not be a message? You talk that? about different economies. You create the economy of nine billion, the economy of uh, no, I'm talking about billion. the debt yes. that they incurred. Yes, yeah, and so they, 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 they mentioned the economy of the nine billion. That was a small economy now, it's a, it's a huge one, no, and but, so they, but they're that, taking that was, more, that was more loans 25% of debt to GDP, and now we are talking about 72% of debt to GDP. I see, so you, you, you have basically no fiscal space to do anything, and that's because you think you can borrow your way out of. Uh, out of debt, which is not possible, and therefore the ideas of entrepreneurial creativity and really supporting businesses, um, not killing them with um, energy prices, um, inflation, um, devaluing currency. And those are the things that go to give economic freedom for people to operate. And I, I believe it is that that we can bring. The, back. the, the, the currency's stability for these years, uh, notwithstanding, you think uh, it's a currency that's not doing well? Well, the currency has not done well. Um, you have quite seen stable some few it's been, months. Yeah, I mean, this, these few months it has been quite stable. Mm. Uh, but you have moved from 1.2 to 4. Unless you want to forget it, but that's real. Um, you know, you can't brush it under the carpet. You have to accept that you came and met something and this is what you have done to it. Clearly, you don't have the competence um, to keep an economy that stays within a certain debt-to-GDP model, uh, that uh, maintains a currency at a point in which businesses can work, that provides energy to make sure that there's productivity. I mean, the gross savings of the country has been depleted when you run deficits of double-digit figures for about three years. Uh, there's no savings left. And then corporates are therefore not producing as much as they do, mm. so they don't have savings. And individuals like you and I, you know, you get your paycheck and it's over before you can say jack. Um, so then there's no give and you think that you can borrow to continue. So now um, interest payment now constitute the second largest government expenditure. From 680 billion or so that you used to pay in 2008, you are now paying 10 billion. Okay, um, so you have created a situation in which things are difficult, where private sector is, is just aghast as what it should do, mm. um, where productivity has shrunk, and therefore you are compelled to increase taxes. So it's just a very vicious cycle that you are in, and until you get a fresh look at it, you know you are stuck and derailed. Talking about the interest payment that you, you, you mentioned, your, your opponents are saying that what you're paying isn't all the loans that they they took and that the interest are some of the loans that your party took when you were in past some time ago. Well, the issue for me, Bright, is if somebody says that, mm. um, saying it is different from the fact. Okay. You know, if you were paying six, eighty million CDs and you are now paying, you know, literally um, ten billion, which is uh, you know. Uh, 
for interest, interest payment, um, gives you no room to maneuver I see. and you want to blame somebody. And the question also becomes one of, of value for money, you know. When you have a Legon hospital of 600 beds costing $20 million and you have a rich uh, rehabilitation of 200 beds costing $250 million, uh, you begin to see how you lose money and how then, you know, these you, problems... You won't care about the equipment in these facilities? Well, I'm, I'm talking about value. 600 beds at 230, the new mm. hospital, rehabilitation, you know. So we can play with the margins as much as we want. In the end, the number will be written down. I see. And the number leads to uh, 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 an impractical way in which to live. Um, you won't do that in your household. Uh, where you, you just keep borrowing and where do you go next? So then you go to your neighbor to tax your neighbor. We are being taxed. I just saw um, a $90 uh, million dollar, um, bond that the government did. Mm. The government is paying 6% and Ghanaians are buying it. Meanwhile, they, they borrowed okay. at 10% um, on the international market. All right. So we have challenges. Your response? You see the, 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 the flippant way in which, excuse me, you know, my love, the some numbers were used, mm. 90 billion mm. US dollars, mm. when we never borrowed, the highest we borrowed on the bond market was 1 billion. And he's saying he's saw, he seen a bond, 90 billion Ghana, do we know even what we're talking about? Maybe, did, did he not say million? It's a billion. He's okay. say, yes. So okay. anyway. And he did the same thing with, you know, another one. I mm. mean, for, for, for me, that is a case of the preacher that could not heal himself. You know, the, what? the preacher that could not heal himself. Okay, so let's start off with uh, the vice president. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the vice president. Um, again, I think, I don't know how many minutes we have, but mm. um, I explained the issue of um, what happened with condoms and all those things. Uh, but we know what is going on today. But frankly, if you look at the number of levies, you know, that have been imposed today in comparison, you know, with, you know, the four which I mentioned, you know, which all had sunset trade, which all had sunset clauses. I mean, the verdict is there. You know, that's, you know, um, it was a lie. You know, I'm looking for mm. <laughs> trying to be <laughs> not to be very harsh with my mm. language, you know. It was completely because, you know, at the time we had done, as I said, there was a fiscal stabilization levy and there was the uh, temporary imports, you know, duty which they took on and they continued with it. Mm. You know, even after they came to power, they couldn't, you know, take them, you know, uh, off. As for, you know, the blame game, today he's blaming GRA. <laughs> you mm. know, so you see, right? Why don't you go to your, evaluate your performance, right? Just as you were evaluating your predecessor's performance. Now you are blaming the agency that is under the Ministry of Finance, right? Which doesn't set the targets. They contribute in setting the target, but ultimate decisions to the Ministry of Finance. Mm. They contribute in the sense that they hold a database, right, for all the taxes because they are in the field, they are collecting and they help with the projection. Let me clarify this, because mm. it's creating some confusion that mm. I was also saying that uh, GRA, you know, says, no, I'm saying that during the budget hearing, mm. just like all, we meet all agencies mm. with their ministries, GRA is an agency of the Ministry of Finance. Mm. And what does GRA do? GRA collects taxes with the government mandates. And GRA has an, a very elaborate database, which they started setting up for year piece up. And so if you are going to implement a policy, GRA can go in and tell you the effects of that policy. Mm. GRA can tell you that this is a trend, you know, of performance. you both nominal and real, right? And therefore, uh, Minister, if you are going to implement this, you are going to, this is the effect. For example, the benchmark which he was talking about, which he said, he, they changed it to just a benchmark, reduction of the value. Remember he said they were going to abolish import duty. Mm. Mm. How do you do that as a developing country? You remember what I explained already? Mm. You want to open up. And what they did when they, come, when they came to power, you know, was to reduce the value of imports 
You remember the cost mm. I was talking about? Mm. If you reduce the value of imports, you know, to from hundred to fifty. If you're supposed to ten percent, you're supposed to collect ten. You collect five, and that's how come the the, the whole system was stuck now because you never. And what do you do? You encourage others, even people who are importing to Burkina Faso and others, using our ports, you know, to take advantage of this and smuggling the goods and all that, right? So I, I, I think that some of these things are just things which I say in any events, you know, like the amnesty, which I said. There was an amnesty in 2017. Tell us how that amnesty performed. There was a benchmark. Today is repeating the same thing on import duties and all those things. Tell us the import duties that we waived, you know, from auto to everything. Yes, some are needed for incentives. And where is accountability for it? And you go back and you blame GRA, you blame, you continue blaming, blaming President Mahama, you know, and the rest. In any event, we, we did not increase the uh, tax rates. The tax rates were increased by this administration. Mm. Uh, the personal income tax and the corporate income tax, which has been increased, you know, to 35 percent, they were 25 percent. So they increased it. Uh, the VAT we were talking about, you remove a VAT, you say it's not part of VAT, then you increase the VAT rate, and that rate, you know, continues to be part of the system. That's what we should be talking about. Mm. You know, so they increased the VAT rate. We didn't increase it. They removed it and denied input tax credit, mm. you know, to... I, I said in my earlier introduction that, you know, when I was talking about ERP, SAP, and what we did, you know, the, the, the corporate income tax rate used to be at 55 and 65%. And they were brought down gradually over a decade until we got to the 20, 25%, which they have now come after 40 years to increase to 35. And yet still, you know, the highest point this year, they said it will be the record, but the highest point of tax to GDP ratio. It's 2015. Despite all the levies and things that have been, the highest point, the data is there. It's 2015. So what have they achieved with all the increases in taxes and other things? You know, so, uh, Randy, uh, the, let me also address this issue of investment. Mm. You see, it was a policy discussion that was taking place in many countries. When you invest in table, when you invest in even the stock market, corporate, you know, and others, the investment is not tax. We're not talking about the investment. But the income you are earning, right, the income you are earning, right, is income. And the debate is, if you sell, we exclude residential housing. But if you invest in commercial property and you sell it, you pay capital gains tax. It's on the books. That's your form of investment, right? It's a house. Sorry, an office building which you want to rent because residential, as I said, you know, is excluded. What is the difference then between another taxpayer? You know, fairness is a very important principle in, in taxation. How about a person who puts his money in investments in the form of paper investments, securities, bonds, and the rest? We are not talking about, as for uh, your, your house, uh, your, this, you pay rent tax. It's another form of income when you sell it. So we are saying when you liquidate the capital gains or the income you are earning, at the moment it's blanket. And we are saying that this was blanket at a time when the government needed money back in the 60s and 70s, when the tax regime had it matured. So as part of the discussion, is it time to be rethink some of these things? Because as your economy changes, you know, and even services. Who, who spoke about services back in the even 70s and 80s, right? It started from the, the 19, early 1990s into the 2000 services sector and the rest, right? And that also leads to another one, which is we were not going to tax interest because interest is, is on your savings. It's not income you are going to save. What we're going to tax under the VAT, which they, have, they are reintroducing in various ways, is ATM. If you go to US and ATM, is it a service? How is it different from architects giving you advice? Right? So it is a fee that you pay for ATM and for all those financial services that, you know, is the target of the tax. So it's not savings. 
Right? So, but it's very easy to pick these things. And you see that now they've come and from e levy to everything, you know, the same notion is coming in, but in different forms. Mm. You know, why don't you stretch the VAT? You remove VAT and you talk about e levy. The e levy actually taxes the money on, in your wallet which you transfer. Not the fee, not just the fee. That's one of the handicaps of this thing. But we are saying, we are not targeting your interest. You, I mean, it's savings. And a VAT is not consumption, it's savings. Until you take that interest and you go and buy a commodity or something, then we tax it. But when you take that interest and you go, you know, in an advanced economy like ours, and you go and use the ATM, you are using the services of uh, additional services. Okay. Which Let's quickly really move to the former finance minister. He speaks about, about 10 billion cities on interest, no fiscal space, um, the exchange rate. Um, he, he speaks about also uh, thinking that you can borrow your way out of a messy situation, a uh, value for money. <laughs> That's what I said. I mean, yeah. I've just one aspect. He couldn't hear himself. He couldn't hear himself. He heal himself. Because he has done Westerns, isn't it? Really? Of course, yes. Look at it. Look at We left, you know, uh, of course, he's using nominal values. Mm. So you can translate the debt at 100%. We never go to 95%. Because COVID and Russia, Ukraine. We never go to 95% anyway. Mm. I already explained COVID and Russia. Mm. What about all the money that flowed in? What did you do with them mm. to resolve them? Mm. You know, what, what did you do? Why, why did you prepare for COVID instead of understating? So that you put more money into the stabilization fund and don't go and be borrowing, you know, as we were attempting to do. Exchange rate. Exchange rate. Mm. What's the exchange rate today? Mm. You know, and by the way, the 1.2 is talking about, remember the real denomination had just taken place yes. two years old. Yes. Yes. So you can say that within one, one and a half years, they had increased by 0.2. Mm. And you could have seen the trajectory, you know, that was being followed. Mm. If the thing is one to one, in fact, it was 90 point something to one. And then within one and a half years of taking over, it's moved to 0.2. I think the evidence is there. Mm. The rate of the decision. Well, what do you make of the conduct of the central bank in all of this? Um, who bowed on the central bank? That's my question. Who put pressure on the central bank to do the deficit financing? The central bank says. It's not that a decision that the governor. The central bank made. says that by law. Five um, percent. It says by, but yeah, they say by law, they, they, they are enjoined to come in and salvage the economy. Whatever they did was to save the economy. Well, yes, I know the economic emergency that they declared, and I know there are lawyers who disputed it anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe we need to revisit that, because if the governor can take that decision, mm -hmm. in spite of all the other flows, then maybe it needs to go to parliament, you know, for, and I say it in all honesty, you know, for them to review you know, the conditions under which, you know, the governor has that power, right? Mm. But I would have thought that the more sober, uh, relatively speaking, uh, speeches that were given, you know, when things were getting out of hand in Legon and other places, I sat in there. Mm. The more sober, you know, reflected what actually happened. Mm. The one that was delivered in Legon, and then the one that was delivered, you know, at the annual meeting of the... Uh, managers of banks at Aliza Hotel, you know, I, I find that to be more reflective mm -hmm. of the pressure that, you know, the fiscal authorities were bringing to bear, you know, on the governor to monetize the economy. I don't respect the governors. Some of them, as I said, governors were contemporary, you know, um, more or less, uh, because he was uh, in the research department at the time, knew him very well. Uh, I know Maxwell very well, and I know, and I know them. I mean, in terms of their, you know, uh, uh, qualification and expertise and all that. And Maxwell had done missions like I did, uh, fine and the rest. So, um, so I would put more premium on those sober reflections that he did as a warning to the government that the fiscal was getting out of hand. Mm. Because you couldn't even, uh, the most, how many countries finance their third deficit? Was it only Ghana that was affected mm. by COVID? That's a question which even lay people ask. Was it only Ghana that was affected by COVID? And remember what I said. The fund is now saying that we're pre-existing conditions, you know, before COVID. So if we got all this money to resolve COVID, was the additional financing actually meant to resolve those pre 
existing conditions, which some of us have said mm. for a very long time. Mm. So that's an open question. Th there are two, my final question yeah. to you, two issues that I've had the last close to 30 years. And I keep hearing it again. Uh -huh. Changing the structure of the economy and widening the tax base. Tax base. Yes. How come we are still caught in sixes and sevens over this? This structure what of the, needs to be done. Yes, the structure of the economy has changed. Mm -hmm. Right? And I was having an interesting conversation with uh, some, you know, I wouldn't want to mention all names, uh, respected, you know, people, and I respect them for their view. And the, the discussion was, do we grow our way out of debt? And I said, I think differently, because that is why we set up the second fund, despite growing. Because remember, and I pointed out that one, the economy grew on the back of services. And when we did rebasing, even before rebasing, services of took are Greek. That's growth. That's healthy growth. Mm -hmm. And the transformation of the economy. How come we went to HIPIC? Mm -hmm. And how come, you know, post HIPIC we started accumulating? You know, then we found oil. And there was a spike. Then two additional oil fields, three. There was a spike. Those are growth. And yet we didn't heal ourselves out of deficits and, you know. So I'm saying, look to the advanced countries. Growth goes up and down. But why does the UK have a debt management office? Why, the U, why does the US Treasury have a debt management office? If you are not learning to pay when you are growing and you keep borrowing, you will still crash despite your growth. Mm. Right? So yes, let's look at the structure of the economy, which is changing. Ghana's structure is changing. Right? We're talking about lithium today, which I wish had the same parameters that the Petroleum Revenue Management Act. Maybe it's time to just have a natural resource you know, management act to have that. And use the revenue additional to address issues consciously as advanced countries come, you know, do. So they preach these things to us. You can okay, grow, growth, primary balance and all those things. And yet we have experienced the growth. So it's time to say, let us look at what they do on the market and do the same thing. For me, that is it. What about widening the tax base? Widening the tax base will... You say a few of us are carrying the whole load. That's the structure of every tax. The because, structure of every tax? Yes. And my reason, particularly the ones that have to do directly with the... You know, because the... Even in the advanced countries, the big corporations, Microsoft and the rest, they are few. But they bring in about 80%. <laughs> you know, of, of the revenue. And if you take Ghana, by the time you, you, you go from the oil companies to, you know, the, the mining route, companies, yeah. despite even the concessions you give giving them, and then you come into the Unilevers and others of this world, and frankly, the corporate income tax. That's why the GRA has a large taxpayer unit to make sure that you, you, they are more sophisticated, both in what they pay, but they can also in looking at the tax law and finding you know some loose loopholes when, when i hear the issue of um, so my sorry so yes. my Randy, so if i may not, so my point is that you would always have that you know because you can't expect low income people up to a point to contribute more than high income people and then which is why the the those who are relatively richer pay a higher you know now so when you talk about the uh Widening the tax base. The interpretation is not just one. It's not just a number of taxpayers you can cover, including small businesses mm. who are going to contribute, you know. The structure of the economy itself and how it is changing itself is part of it. And adapting the tax, you know, to suit it. So the financial sector. So you see, after we criticize taxation of the financial sector, which is the largest economy, and you want to continue taxing the cocoa farmers and the rest, mm. you see, we are back to introducing e levy. And the rest is mm. that what they say for the same financial sector. Mm. So, so, so sometimes when the, the issue of the widening of the tax base comes up, the issue of the formalization of the economy Absolutely. or the informal nature of the economy comes in. And automation, and, as I mentioned. Yes, and what, what we're told is that the economy is so informal that there are so many people who are not captured. And so it is only the few who are captured in the formal sector who end up carrying the burden. 
And so there is the need to aggressively formalize the informal sector so that we rope in a lot more people. You see, today, in the Scandinavian countries, and we may not reach there immediately, in the Scandinavian countries, they use the national identification number, the taxpayer identification number, as we used to call it, to gather information. And you are just sitting there and they send you your tax return. It's happening in the U.S. From data that they have gathered, using your national ID, using your social security number, part of the solution is automation. I just showed you how we could enforce VAT compliance if the domestic tax is, is automated. Right? So you can widen the tax base through you know, uh, 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 automation, through improving the systems and processes. Similarly, you can control your expenditure through your systems and processes. And when I started my career, I used to have a room. I said that they didn't have a taxi. They used to have it, actually. Where you had those big mainframes. I'm sure you've seen mm-hmm. them. I mean, today, the laptop or even this phone is holding more information than... So I think uh, that many of those you know, mainframes and even earlier computers and the rest. So I think we should, we should look at some of these cliches in a wider you know, broader, you know, manner. And that's why I see countries like Sony and, uh, and the rest doing. They are very efficient mm. in the use of technology. They are very efficient. Because if the national ID number is to work as it is, it means everybody will be in the database. Mm. And so long as you produce your national ID for some transaction, right, including even getting a special court order to look at, you know, the flows into Then we should be on the right account. path because... Yeah, because we have most a of the, ID. But, yeah, but many of the yes, we but they are not. Teen, yeah, we have a, that's right, mm. right? Because there was a team which is not a national ID, ID number for mm. individuals and mm. the rest, you know. But you see, if you have an app, you know, which is issuing or compelling businesses developed by private sector, compelling businesses to issue e-vat invoices and the rest, right? It's a positive move, but where is the GRE database that will process it? Mm-hmm. Where is the GRE database that will match that information with icons? Mm. And how come for seven years we have delayed and not done that? So the phase two would have dealt with all of this from 2017? Yes, it will start dealing with them at the minimum. Okay. All right. Honorable Zetepe, thank you so very much uh, for your time. Uh, we've done uh, well over two hours. Yeah, I just, I just watched the time. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for joining And I me. thank you very much. I, yes. I, I, I also thank the listeners. Yes. And, uh, and I hope that some good information has come out of this. Right, yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> so we wish you well and um, would, would um, call on you anytime we need uh, some uh, clarification or elucidation on the, on the issues. Thank you. Absolutely. And enjoy the As the manifesto is coming. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this has been... Um, a special um, edition of Good Morning Ghana, one-on-one with the former finance minister, the Honorable Seth Emmanuel Tekwe. Uh, uh, <laughs> enjoy the rest of the holiday and uh, stay tuned to Metro TV. We have a lot of interesting um, content for you uh, throughout the holiday uh, period. Happy Easter. To help meet your business and private printing needs successfully, we have just the right products and services. At Appointed Time Printing Limited, we specialize in digital